All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Continuous and Checkpoint Restore Micro Conference at Thermos. I've honestly lost track of how many ones of those we've had by now. Um, so you might have noticed, unlike last year, we didn't get the full day, so we've got the afternoon and then a bit of the evening instead. Um, and we've tried to do the usual kind of mix and match of both continuous topics and uh, checkpoint restore, so that hopefully we, we keep everyone in the room, maybe, we'll see. Um, the IFAPAD address is right there. We're gonna have a laptop that always tries and show it there. If it's no longer showing the right thing, tell me and I'll make sure we scroll. Um, schedule is this thing. We've not, we did some switches yesterday of two talks, I think. Um, otherwise, we've not modified it. Um, and that's on the website, so as long as you looked at it this morning, you're fine. Um, and I believe that's it for what I've got. Uh, maybe just for the speakers again, like we do want it to be more clear discussions, so uh, do try to engage uh, with people. And <laughs> for the audience, like don't wait until the end to op talk. Like it's yeah, just interact and chat. Uh, we've got a throwable thing somewhere. Uh, right here. There, okay. So yeah, those will fly your way. If you've got a question, please wait for the microphone. We would like the recording to include people's questions on them. So we've got two microphones, they'll come your way um, if you raise your hand. Um, I think that's, that's what I've got. So um, Adrian can get set up. I uh, don't know if we want to wait to be oh. exactly on time so <coughs> if someone shows up. For that exact on time, I don't know. We probably also should point out we have an etherpad, so for, right. for people to take notes. And uh, I don't know if we put it up on the screen right here, but yeah, th there's switch. like we have a ridiculously long name for this etherpad, but you can see it here: etherpad.net/p/lpc2019 slash underscore containers underscore and underscore checkpoint underscore restore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. You can put get them all, them, them all so bitly and just <laughs> give the short URL. Or <laughs> we'll list them on the website. I'm not sure if there are anyone on the website. Oh, yeah, tempted to say we can probably just go down. Yeah. So, um, Thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Adrian Weber. I'm working on process migration at least for the last 10 years. I'm involved in Creo, which this is about partly, at least since 2012, I'm doing things with on Creo. And this is, the talk is actually about how to avoid what we call the PID dance, but I like this shorter title better, so then I just start. So um, this is about checkpoint restore and user space. Um, Creo. Creo was actually discussed at, at Linux Bundles in 2011, so it's always been kind of here at Linux Plumbers. And from the beginning, one of the goals of Creo was to, to be as, as transparent as possible. And Transparent as possible means that Creo should be able to checkpoint and restore any process without pre-requirements. This, this goal comes from other checkpoint restore implementation which ex existed at that time. So it was, there were external kernel modules or you had to LD preload libraries to intercept system calls. So there were different kinds of um, checkpoint restore implementation and and Creo had a goal to not be like these in, in some way to be able to pos to be able to restore and checkpoint any process you have in the system. One of the results from being as transparent as possible is the PID stays the same during it had during checkpointing and it will be the same during restore. And for if you have a single process it wouldn't really be important. The process could change its um, PID, but if Creo, what Creo usually does, you point it to a PID and it will restore this process and all child processes. It will checkpoint the process and all child processes. 
And if you want to restore it, you want to keep the um, parent-child relation intact, and, and that's why it will always restore a process with the same PID or, or the complete process tree. And uh, so it will restore the process with the same process ID. And this, this opens up, one of the problems with this is that this opens up um, create, create to, uh, the restore to PID collision. So if the PID already exists on the system, the restore will just fail and, and stop. One solution around this is uh, um, PID namespaces. So Creo often works on containers. Containers often use <coughs> PID namespaces. So if you restore something in a PID namespace, you usually don't have the problem that, um, that uh, you, you get a PID collision. But um, I'm saying it, Creo is independent of PID namespaces. And I mean that you can restore it with a PID namespace, you can restore it in the currently running PID namespace, but it's, it, it should work in, in, in every case. And I'm mentioning this here because when we started to talk about Clone 3, I got a lot of, a lot of questions, but you're always using PID namespaces, and, and this is not the case. So a restore should also work outside of a new PID namespace and in the currently running PID namespace, and then um, you have the possibility of a um, PID collision, but um, Creo would like still to work in such an environment. To restore a, a process, Creo um, morphs itself into the restored process, and one um, good point to, um, to describe this is, uh, I like always the file descriptor case, when you um, checkpoint a process, Creo remembers the uh, file descriptor ID, the, where the file descriptor is pointing to, to which file, and the position. And during restore, Creo just tries to recreate it as it was during checkpointing. And when the process continues to run, the file descriptor will be the same, will point to the same file and to the same position of the file. And the same happens for, for basically for the process tree. And what Creo does, it does a clone for each PID, TID, the process had during um, checkpointing, and so the process tree is recreated as it used to be during checkpointing. And this clone for each PID to make this possible, currently the, the PID dance, what we call it, is necessary. And the PID dance consists of those steps. You open um, PROC NS last PID, you write the PID you want, minus one to NS last PID, you close NS last pit, you do the actual clone, and then you do a get pit to verify that the PID you hope to get, you actually got. And this is, uh, this is uh, open to race conditions, as you can probably see, because during writing to uh, NS last pit and doing the actual clone, some other process could have been created, and then you, your get pit will return something else. And in this case, also, Creo will abort the restore. Um, as it requires multiple um, system calls, it's also a bit slower as it could, could be. And one point I want to mention at the end also, it also requires Capsys admin. This is not really important to the PID dance or clone three, but this is something I want to um, um, mention at the end of my talk. So, um, Interestingly, there was um, an approach for Checkpoint Restore in 2010. They also tried to create processes with um, certain PIDs. At that, at that time, um, NS last pit didn't exist, so what they um, tried to do in 2010 is uh, create a new system called eClone, where you could specify the PID and you would get a, a new process with the PID you, you requested. This was an in-kernel approach to checkpoint restore with over 100 patches, and this was never merged. And Creo can actually be seen as a result of, of that failure to get it merged because it moved a lot of the things, like it's mentioned in its name, to user space and not to do it in kernel. So avoiding the PID dance in 2019 um, is, is based, or at least we want to base it on, on the newly added clone three. Clone 3 was 
introduced because um, the flags for clone ran out when clone pitfd was introduced. So for new clone flags, there was no space left if you don't remove the old unused flags. And if we're looking, for example, at a time name space, there would have been no free flag to create, uh, to do a clone with a time name space. So clone three was introduced thanks to Christian and Jan. And once, when I first heard about uh, clone three, I immediately, immediately thought about, this would be great to um, have it extended um, to use um, clone three and to, to be possible to specify a PID you actually want for your, uh, for your process you want to create. And I wrote a first patch a few months ago maybe when I heard about it and there was some private discussion about it. And when I first created it, I, I, I didn't um, limit it to Capsys admin. I just basically let anyone create a process with whatever PID um, the user wanted. And this approach was, was not seen very positive and so I talked again with the Creo developers. They said they think it's important to continue and we continue to work on it. And we um, have now a, a patch which could be merged soon maybe that has the same restrictions as NS last pit. So, so you have Capsys admin and you can create with one single system call a new process with a PID you, you would like to have. So using clone three with set TID would look like this. You just do your clone. You specify the TID you, you want to, to the one you want and the process created should have um, the PID you specified. As already mentioned, this still requires Capsys admin and it has the same limitations as, as, as NS last pit. So this fails if the PID already exists each PID namespace has to have a PID one or this will fail. And if we can, if, if this actually gets merged, we can start to uh, change Creo to move away from, from its current PID dance to use um, clone three instead. And one more thing uh, which we, we discussed um, as part of this uh, clone three change is to relax Capsys admin on NS last pit and clone three. The reasons we would like to see this from, from maybe the Creo side is um, rootless container migration. I'm also working um, partly a bit on the integration of Creo into Podman and running Podman containers with non-root. With Creo not requiring Capsys admin would make it possible somehow to have um, container migration for non-root containers running, uh, for, for running containers as non-root on your system. And if it's not Capsys admin, maybe it would be possible to have that capability on the file doing the migration. Another use case where relaxation of Capsys admin would be nice is um, the MPI use case. In, in HPC environments, checkpoint restore used to be an important topic. Right now it's not so important anymore because it requires a lot of time writing all those checkpoints to disk. But still, if we could have a way to do rootless, um, to offer checkpoint restore to rootless MPI implementations, it could lead to um, more use of, of Creo in, in those um, use cases. And there's actually a talk from uh, someone at Google later, an update on task migration at Google. And I saw they um, are, um, mentioning to also relax Capsys admin to something like cap restore. And this is something um, I would also like to see. So if there's something this is, uh, who, which will be worked on, um, I'm really open to, to work with you on this to um, get this going. And uh, with this, I'm already at the end of my presentation. These are the links I just mentioned there and there I'm at the end. Are there any questions? <laughs> from Eric. Eric. Yeah. But want to address the um, permission relaxation thing really quickly. Um, 
if you make it NS capable CAPTCHA admin of the PID namespace, mm -hmm. um, that will mean as long as you create a PID, PID namespace without being root, you, you can do a, do a restore without being root. Okay. Um, okay. Microphone. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of that's what we did. So you need uh, uh, you need to be NS capable in the owning user namespace of the target pit namespace. In which case, rootless isn't a problem because uh, rootless you would have created the pit name unless unless you want to do unprivileged restore w for not for rootless container but for like just a random process. In that case, it wouldn't work. But for rootless containers, it would work. Oh, oh really? Okay, I, yeah. I haven't thought about yeah. that. Okay. And then the, the other part that. I, I, I keep picking on multiple um, 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 not level of the PID name space being restored at the same time. I was talking earlier, someone was saying that had gotten dropped because they couldn't figure out how, how the permissions sh should work. And um, it occurs to me that um, if during restore what you do is you take who, whoever you start out as permissions, you know, root or um, the, the um, un unprivileged user who does stuff, and you never call set UID, and you fork all your processes before that. Um, you know, and so you you should be able to use all your original, have all your original permissions go through while you're creating creating your your processes with their, with their PIDs. So so it shouldn't be a problem to be able to restore multiple um, PID levels of, of, of PID names PIDs and PID namespaces at the same time. But what if you have an uh, intermediate user namespace? Um, you, you you would go through and like create that on the side and um, set call call set and s to, to get things built, mm. but 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 you don't you don't you build, do that outside of building your process tree. Right. So it's the, basically, you have another process which is like privileged with context to it, which is in the top level user namespace. Well, the the thing with intermediate user namespace is you have to drop privileges. Exactly. Yeah. To, to start doing st stuff with that. So you have the intermediate process that drops privileges. You keep all your privileges while you set every all up your process tree, mm -hmm. and you call um, set UID and set you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait, I think that works. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you can. Yeah, you can dro drop your user namespace. Actually, we, when we restore a process tree, we need to to. Co so we have one process which is in this PID namespace already. Then yeah. we need to restore a child, so we need to fork from this process and restore all PIDs on all level. I mean, in parent PID namespace, parent of parent PID namespace. How can we check permission for the parent PID namespace? Okay, so your cred, which has, you know, so your, your, your starting process that forks, that forks and forks and forks and creates all, all your children. Um, it's cred, Starts out being, you know, ha having all, all the appropriate per permissions to create all your PID namespaces and do everything. And so, as long as you don't change that cred, you still have it. Um, you might have to call set and s to get into the PID namespaces and stuff you know, for, for your children. But as long as you don't don't mess with your creds until after you've created the process tree, um, you'll have all the all of your permissions um, while the while the tree tree of processes is, is being built. So it'll pass all the permission checks. Okay, I will see. I <laughs> if you have an intermediate user namespace, it'll be it, the owner would be different. So if you, so you, I guess your point is is that if you have this process tree creation thing, you then can have something else, which is uh, Capsis admin in the top level PID namespace owning user namespace, and that will have privileges over the lower one even though to set up you would still need to create a new user namespace. Is that what you're saying? So, so, so your initial process has privileges over everything because right. it, it's your user. Yep. Um, and you keep those credentials while you're creating the process tree. To create the um, subordinate PID namespaces, you go off on the side, you create a user namespace, go into the user namespace, create the PID namespace, and then the process tree you call set and s. Um, so so the, the children show up in that PID namespace. So the PID namespace ha has a user namespace limitation, but your process still doesn't. So it, so, so it ha has permissions over the parent PID namespace. 
I think I'll have to think about it a bit more today. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. it, this, this seems very, like, very elaborate and very complicated. And I think that one of the other reasons that I brought up why this didn't come to fruition was that you didn't really need it, right? I mean, Pavel said. Uh, if you go on, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we want to support uh, restore checkpoint restore for nested feeding spaces, but when we tried to implement this, we just found that it's it's right now it's it's very complicated. So now it just live in separate patch. We don't want to merge this complicated code into the crew right now, but in the future we want to have support for nested feeding spaces. So it's like checkpoint restore for uh, nested containers when you run a few containers inside another container. Okay. So, so, I, so, so I guess that's, that, that's enough for now, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll continue this conversation um, with the code. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess that's it. Okay, thanks. Right. Yeah. Deja vu. Uh, shall we wait till 30 or running with it as it goes? Mm -hmm. Shall we wait till the exact time? Or uh, maybe? Yeah. It's probably one of the time that will be easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's going to have fun if someone is trying to like jump <coughs> between packs and then I'll jump between packs. We already shipped in 77 Durango, so that will be too easy. Well, that was yesterday, yeah. But so I'm going to reprocess it because it's more than two. Yeah. But, but, also, but also the, the packs are not open enough. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. yeah, you can't actually do that much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we can do that. <coughs> okay, so uh, we are researching uh, an interesting topic. Uh, it, it became a tradition, like news from the academia. Anyway, uh, we are working on. Uh, I'm here. Yeah, we, we can open it. Uh, I, no, I hear too much echo. Uh, anyway, uh, we are looking to. Uh, we investigated different ways to make containers more secure. One of the one of the known uh, protection mechanisms for for years has been the uh, MMU and virtual memory. It's how kernel protects itself from uh, user processes. It how it it how user processes are protected from each other. Uh, so what we've been thinking is that uh, uh, we can uh, <coughs> we can use uh, uh, multiple address spaces inside the Linux kernel. So different parts of Linux kernel will see uh, different mappings on the physical memory uh, because uh, uh, vulnerabilities are inevitable and there is nothing uh, will change. I don't think uh, that uh, we'll ever able to produce any software without any vulnerability. Uh, so uh, restricting access from some parts of kernel to other parts of the kernel will make <coughs> the attacker life harder and will uh, protect, uh, will, pro will give better protection. There is also been uh, uh, some work in the VM area, which is work in progress about KVM address space isolation and the process local memory, Amazon people proposing for storing VM secrets. And <coughs> Uh, actual uh, restricted address space is implemented with everybody known uh, per kernel page table isolation. Uh, what happens is user's page, user, 
a kernel view, kernel mode part of user process page table. It has a restricted mapping for on only essential bits that required to enter the syscall and continuous execution. And there, it, it, there it happens a switch to the complete kernel page table. Uh, our first attempt at using address spaces for improving uh, isolation inside Linux kernel was uh, we named it system call isolation. Uh, the idea was to use uh, a restricted page table for execution of system calls. So whenever an application executes system call, it gets uh, some minimal set of mappings that are enough to start running the system call. And whenever, whenever uh, the system call processing requires additional, to access additional code or data, we get a page fault. And then in that page fault, we can decide whether the access can be granted or not. So when we were thinking about what uh, filters and how to make decision uh, whether to grant access or not, the only thing that came to mind that we could try doing rope gadget prevention uh, by checking that uh, any call that is going to be taken will be to a known uh, symbol and not uh, to the middle of a function. So uh, it didn't really fly. Uh, first, uh, uh, to have proper op prevention, uh, you have uh, to check on the return rather than on the call. Uh, it has a problem with granularity. So whenever you, we already allowed access to a certain page, the entire page is mapped. So attacker can jump into the middle of that page because it's already in the page table. And the worst, uh, I, I've been able to measure performance at some point. So uh, we don't want to go there. Uh, the next, okay, it's here. The next uh, idea we had, and we didn't start to work on it yet, is to create some special mappings in the process virtual address space with mmap secret or m advice secret, uh, so that uh, user can say, okay, I want this region to be private for me, and this region won't be visible to other not only to other processes, but also to the kernel itself. It will be essentially every page that goes, uh, that populates this memory region will be dropped from the direct map. And then uh, this will allow something like opening a secret file, decrypting its contents, and, uh, and using and storing uh, secrets from a file uh, inside protected memory areas that is not mapped by anybody except the process that uses it. Uh, and an assumption uh, that for block IO, uh, you don't usually go to copying bits from, uh, from, a, mem from a device to memory, but uh, it's possible to demo directly into the page uh, that uh, will be already mapped into the process address space. <coughs> and uh, another thing we, we are actively trying to work on uh, with different level of success is marrying address spaces and namespaces. So um, currently we are working on uh, assigning a private page tables for every instance of network namespace. Network namespace is uh, allocating uh, its objects from, uh, uh, it recreates a uh, copy of networking of, entire, of the entire networking stack that is mostly independent of the rest of the system, except some places where you need to cross a uh, namespace boundaries. For instance, when SKB travels from one namespace to a new namespace or to the other namespace. And most of the namespace, network namespace objects are private to that namespace, so probably we can be able, we may be able to make them invisible in the page tables of other network namespaces. So it's something like adding a PGD to StructNet, and then uh, whenever process joins a network namespace with one of the existing system calls, its PGD is replaced with that one of the network namespaces. This allows us to save a context switch hit because con the, the change of page table from full kernel page table to restricted page table becomes implicit with switch to. 
And uh, again, uh, the objects that are visible inside network namespace are dropped from direct map and they, they are not visible in other name, namespaces. <coughs> I won't go now into the memory management details. I tried it uh, about an hour earlier. Uh, and uh, supposing we can actually make it work, what is the model that is most appropriate for usage by container engines, for users, and so on? And we've got several simple, typical questions that we've been asking ourselves, and probably you'll come up with more. So uh, <coughs> uh, what other namespaces it might gain some security benefits of uh, being able to have their own page table. It seems to make sense for NetNS. It might be useful for Mount, uh, probably <laughs> UTF. <laughs> no, I knew, I knew it. I, no, he it said that. <laughs> yeah. No, it just Mount propagation totally destroys any any ability to isolate one mount namespace from another? Maybe. I know. Okay. You can build namespaces that are disconnected that won't propagate, right? So there is a use case where you could prop, prop possibly disconnect a mount namespace and then use a mechanism like this. Uh, right, but I mean, after completely rewriting all the, uh, all the locking for, for that case. I don't think you have to because it's just this. The locks are all global. It's sort of like the pivot, pivot root use case, right? Mm. So if, with pivot root, you can probably do this. Whether it becomes useful only in that use case is a question, but it's to blanket say you can't do it is not correct. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, e even if it was, if, let's say we can do it for the pivot root use case, um, what would be the protection be effectively? Because for networking, I understand, which is you don't want, for instance, uh, packets in one network space to be attacked from another, but mounts are not secret, it, not, at least not in principle. So, but in principle, once you've done pivot root, they can be disconnected from the kernel's root namespace. If you can actually disconnect the pages as well, you can theoretically, and I don't promise you this is possible, but it's an area of research, you could theoretically inc attach encrypted file systems to this mount namespace that may not be accessible to the main kernel itself, which would be a useful thing for persistent storage, for secret persistent storage for containers, sir. Though we might want It would be kind of funny because you, you can totally access any processes root file system through proc pid slash root. Assuming you can get that. There are lots of disconnection problems that we have. We're, we're just asking the question, if we were to do all these disconnections correctly, can we get a security benefit? Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced that you would run a, an encrypted file system this way. I think you'd be much more likely to run it in some sort of microkernel where the microkernel controls <coughs> the decryption of the pages, and then we just use a standard separated address space for the result, something like that. So perhaps you would never do this, but I was just pushing back on the idea that it's yeah. a, a priori impossible. It's not, so it's useful yeah. to research. Uh, I was gonna say, for, for, for that use case with an encrypted file system, I imagine if uh, theor a theoretical keyring namespace, um, in that would be more useful for that use case, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. We don't have that, right? We this have none yet, so yes. the, there are other namespaces that we haven't actually gotten the kernel this might be useful for as well. Yeah, okay, okay. we'll yep. accept that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, oops. Now, this, this hook, I think it'll work. Uh, the one thing I know is, uh, it seems like the overhead of this and everything and the, and the complexity, it's almost like why not just kind of like, a, if you even mentioned microkernel, make a small like VM and just use that. A <laughs> well, so a VM is a layered security model. A microkernel is on the side security model. The question we're asking with this is, can we separate the execution streams of the kernel in such a way that it gains the density benefit of containers and yet has a security property? I mean, the whole premise of what are the actual security benefits are, right at the moment, containers get a bad rap with security because once you get into the kernel part of the container through a system call, you have access to the entirety of the system. The horizontal attack mm -hmm. profile yeah. is wide. If we can put it into a se segregated address space, we might be able to, to reduce the horizontal attack theoretical. profile theoretically. That's the security benefit we're chasing. It, it, it doesn't mean that it's easy to do it. It's and the question, and then, what is there a performance hit when you do something like it's real new in a couple of months. Yeah. Th there is, because you have to change page tables as you do it. But if the page table is always present and you just call through it on the syscall, we can possibly eliminate the overhead. So there are ways of getting the page table overhead to shift. 
and the page table overhead is uh, a bit less than the overhead you get going through a hypercall anyway, right? Yeah, if you're able to s find a way to crash this, it still crashes the kernel, right? Or is it? Well, if you actually bring down the CPU in something, yeah. uh, it depends. Fault isolation can actually be enforced by this. So it can be the same way as you get an oops in the kernel, but the kernel will continue because the fault was isolated to once you've killed all the processes in this container, the rest of the kernel can continue. So it's not impossible to get fault isolation in this way. But before we get on to fault isolation, we have to have security benefits first. Yeah. The point of this research is to get containers that are more secure than hypervisors. So we already have that with sort of specialized containers like Nabla containers. The question we're looking at here is can we apply the principles more generally? And we're not coming with answers, we're coming with mostly questions to this yeah. group. Uh, so actually, uh, we would be also interested in the mount namespaces where the mount propagation is cut off at the kind of definition level of the mount namespace, uh, simply because, for example, we allow some customization of the environment and we do a lot of mounts in the environment of the user and we don't want for this to accidentally propagate, for example. Like, it's, it's doable correctly without any such features on the kernel side, but it makes it easier to reason and to think if you just by definition cannot get a mount out or get a mount in. Yeah, hey, overall what I've heard is most people prefer mount namespaces without mount propagation. Um, and as much as we, we, we can do about that, you know, um, I would say for purposes of research, mount namespace is probably not some place to look at until you've seen, seen benefits elsewhere. Well, we, we, um, we are definitely starting with network namespace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when we s get some results from our work with network namespace, we'll see where we're going to continue or we just abandon the whole thing maybe. Yeah. If it will become too complex or too inefficient, uh, so yes, we, we are going to drop it. But if we get some good results, and I hope we will do, we'll see what next namespace is going to be and most probably it will be actually user namespace and then you have like per tenant uh, separation of uh, resources and user namespace gets its own page tables and whoever inherits it gets its uh, view of the kernel memory from the owning, from the top process in the user namespace. Yeah, to ground this where it's coming from, with the Nabla containers we were trying to reduce the surface area penetration to the kernel, which means reduce the horizontal attack profile. But if you look at sort of container sandboxes like Nabla, Gvisor and uh, all of them, they all have trouble with networking. Networking is one of the nasty things that you usually have to haul a L2 tap up and then replicate the entirety of the networking in the kernel, which causes you an admin problem because you've just disconnected administration of your sort of sandbox uh, network from your real network and it becomes really difficult. So the question we were asking initially is, if we could isolate the kernel's networking layer in such a way that um, we could actually make use of it at the sort of a layer seven tap, which is where you're supposed to, and therefore use all of the kernel's admin structure, it would greatly simplify these sandboxes and at the same time provide an equivalent amount of protection. So part of the way we're reason we're looking at this is if we could strengthen system calls in such a way that some are safe and some are still unsafe, and then just emulate the unsafe ones in the sandbox and allow the safe ones to pass through, we're actually doing a better job of building a safer sandbox for future container technologies. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of sort of thought around, it's not just about running Docker containers. This is about thinking about would there be a different description of containers that we could actually make more secure. When we've already proven that we can build specialized containers like Nabla that have security properties tw that are about twice as good as that of a hypervisor. So we've cracked the goal of making a container that's more secure than a hypervisor. The question is, can we bring the benefits of the technology globally? Which is, mm -hmm. the that's the background rationale for looking at all of this. Um, I, I guess, big question, what is the pro what, what, what are the attacks you're looking to guard against um, with these address spaces? Is it primarily speculative execution or are you looking primarily at something else? No, it, it's actually not related to speculative execution because well, it's, it's basically, so, so the, the glib answer is everything. But the point <laughs> is that if we can do fault domain, fault domain isolation where the consequences of exploiting only reflect back on the user because of the address space separation, that, that exploit effectively becomes uh, unusable because you can't use it to break out into the rest of the kernel. So if we can do that with significant classes of bugs, we've got a guarding interface that renders a, con uh, a container much safer than it was previously. 
And so it's, it's all about class elimination of faults. The, the big problem we have in research is that we can measure horizontal attack profile in terms of sort of traversal through the kernel, and we can easily measure that with F-trace or something else. We have no means of measuring class of bug elimination by uh, techniques like this yet. We don't know how much it contributes to the, the security of the container. So that's actually another ongoing area of research to see if we can actually get a decent measurement of this. More questions about this bonnet? Okay, so I'll skip the, one, the second one. It seems like pretty much uh, obvious in how to handle nest namespaces uh, with different page tables. As long as you go nesting with namespaces, you restrict Magnus more and more and probably it's uh, the most obvious way to go unless we see for something else. Uh, so if you have user namespaces has this restricted page table and the network namespaces has even more restricted page table and so on and so on. Uh, that's the idea at least for now. Uh, we'll find out again in a couple of months how it uh, may be used and enabled. So next question is more, suppose we can have this marriage between other spaces and namespaces. Do we need a special ABI for this? Is on off on kernel common line is enough or we need a CCFS proc or something or address space namespace or something like that? As far as the user interface um, and how you turn it off and on, that's all going to de depend on what what, what, what? The, the the overhead is, and um, <coughs> and, and what, you know, what what the benefits, what the costs are, and we don't know those, so we don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So at this point, do whatever's easy for your development, and um, at this point, always on. It's not a question. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> But anyway, uh, we need to, to keep in mind that for, even for the development that it should be at least one global off for the entire thing that brings the system performance back to normal. And even if we have some overhead, we, even if we have uh, significant overhead, if we do good security improvement, probably it's worth it. So this more or less should be the case when you can completely turn it off and get, get back to normal and the whole overhead will be like a payment for improved security. Um, your suggestion, that I think sort of like your, your namespace suggestion, it might be worth looking at this per user uh, uh, of the machine as well. Per user namespace or just per user? Per user. Um, you know. Specialized kernel address space per user. We have actually thought about doing that, but we have no mechanism to hang it off yet. Okay. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to suggest, uh, I mean, to me at least, the user namespace seems like it would be the obvious, they're probably not the best solution, which is because, it, because user namespaces are used for privilege separation, on it, not just for UIDs, but also for a variety of other things. And so it might make sense to, to pitch into this, though I have heard people complain about the fact that there are too many things pinned to user namespaces, so that might also be a counter argument as well. Well, that's Docker people because they still don't damn well use it. Can yeah. you just fix that, please? Yes. I, <laughs> I, I'm not a representative for a, for a certain whaling company. Um, so since we're running out of time, uh, the last thing to conclude, the major question here is what is the actual security benefit and how do we measure it? And until we know the answer to that question, we probably won't know the answers to the other one, uh, other ones, and we probably won't be able to correctly estimate what should be done in this area. So, thank you, everybody.
Of course. One second. No, 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 it's, uh, this was probably my mistake. Also, occasionally don't mind the problem. Big one, too, I don't have that kind of problem. You always don't. <laughs> Sorry, I was just uh, me being silly. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, it took a while longer, but um, okay. So this is an update on what we did to, with the second notify RFD, which uh, we presented on uh, last year. So uh, for everyone who's not in the picture, but uh, what you can basically do if you're a task and you're loading a second filter, you can get an FD uh, for the second filter, which you can then ha hand off to a different process. And for usually a more privileged process, such as a container manager, and the container manager can then receive events uh, based on the filter that you registered uh, for the task uh, on what syscall the task makes. Um, the idea being that we would be able to perform certain operations that containers, unprivileged containers and user namespaces would normally not be able to do uh, for them. The container manager would be able to uh, do them for them. Classic example is uh, make not in containers, in user namespaces, sorry, um, doesn't work for character devices and block devices. It obviously works for sockets and uh, FIFOs. Uh, so, but there's a bunch of uh, devices that every container uses, usually that we already bind mount in from the host. Dev U random, dev random, um, dev null, dev zero, and so on. Um, and such devices would be safe to create. So if you do uh, anything inside of the container, does a make not call, and you would be able to somehow detect uh, that this is a valid make not call for a device that you'll find that the container creates, uh, then you, the container manager in this scenario, could perform the syscall um, for the container. Um, so you basically have a whitelist of, of uh, valid devices. Um, so how exactly does this work? Well, uh, you get a second notification. Um, you can stuff the FD you got into an epoll loop. You get notified when the container makes a relevant syscall. In this scenario, a make note syscall uh, for a specific type of device. Uh, then you can do an ioctal on, sorry, you can do an ioctal on this FD and read the uh, second data from it that you usually get with second. Um, you also get a PID uh, for the process which made the syscall and you get a cookie, an ID, which allows you to verify um, that if a task is still valid. Uh, so for example, you could then use the PID to open proc PID mem to like read the memory of the, uh, of the syscall that was made um, to inspect pointer arguments and so on. Um, and if you open, there is obviously a race here. Uh, so the process could get, go away in the meantime and could be recycled and then you would open the wrong proc pit mem. This is where you can use the cookie. Uh, you basically open the FD, you then send the cookie back into the kernel, which is also an ioctl, and ask the kernel, is this task still valid? Is this still a valid cookie? And the kernel then tells you, yes, it's still valid, or it tells you it's, it's not valid anymore. And then you can look at the syscall arguments in more detail, way more detail than currently a seccomp allows you um, to do. So I can give you a quick illustration, hopefully, on how this works. Um, a, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, sorry.
better? Can you read it in the back or should I go on? Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, this is just a container uh, which is in a um, user namespace. And so if you, for example, let me see right here, if you do make not, uh, random name, character device 5.1, which is dev console, um, you get operation that permitted, uh, right? And so we can turn on the options for uh, the second listener. Stefan, do you have them in mind? <laughs> yes, uh, config set, uh, name of container. Um, v2. Uh, security. It does have a character, doesn't it? So, is this a, what did you do? <laughs> That's odd. Yeah, well, in any case, I would <laughs> like to give a demo, but apparently my kernel doesn't like me today. Um, Uh, so it's probably the epilepsy. Um, it doesn't matter. I can uh, recompile if oh, we still have, okay. yeah, if we still have enough time. In any case, sorry for that. Uh, it, it it works fine. You can trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, to get it to actually work, you need uh, you've got the right kernel, but you also need a yet to be released libseccomp, um, which is probably the issue here. You're probably running stuff seccomp, and if things are not happy then. Yeah, if you, you exactly, there's no released uh, second version with this right now. It's probably the issue. Um, in any case, so uh, the problem right now is for make not this works really well, right? Because as I said, uh, for all make not devices, you, you cannot create them at all. And also, the syscall is really easy to allow you for uh, to allow to lend itself to filtering, right? You can filter on the device number of the make not syscall. So if we look at the Um, so right here you have uh, you have the mode argument and you have the device argument and you can register a second filter already that is pretty elaborate that would filter only for example for character devices and for specific device numbers and you would not get any notifications for any other make not syscalls. The kernel would let all of these syscalls that you're not interested in through but it will only get you notifications for example character devices with which match a certain uh, match a certain device number. And then you can also if you're interested in this you can parse out the path name and so on to know where you are actually supposed to create the device and then create the make not device for the container. Um, the problem is this is obviously not doable for uh, for a bunch more syscalls. So for example, let's look at um, Zedex Adder. Uh, Zedex Adder has a path argument, a name argument, and a value argument, and a size argument, and flags. And uh, for a lot of interesting Zedex Adder calls, so for example, um, currently overlay, I think, on some systems, if it creates whiteouts, um, it creates a file that is called overlay dot blah 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 dot whiteout uh, and we would like to succeed that have that succeed inside of containers so that you for example can run docker in there and so on so this is what you want to intercept the problem is filtering becomes really tricky because you need to filter the name of the argument and uh, the value of the argument uh, ideally or in some circumstances so you kind of end up with a filter that sort of catches everything you get all of the noti notifications for, or a lot of notifications for the Zedex adder uh, system call. But, yes? Yeah. Ah, okay, for the Zedex adder system call. Um, and the problem with this is a bunch of those already succeed. So for example, every Zedex adder for the user namespace, uh, user dot something something, would totally succeed. 
Uh, and the problem is now you put the burden on the container manager or the listener to create all of, to do all of those syscalls in view of the container because there is no way uh, to uh, either do deep pointer inspection, deep argument inspection, yes? Like uh, you're trying to do some sort of access control and you, you're proxying, you, you're, you're letting the privilege process do the uh, stuff that the container cannot do, right? So right. What do you think about, and I, 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 I know we've talked about the LSM that I'm working on, the, where you can have attached eBPF programs to uh, LSM hooks. Uh, could this be something we could do as a part of that uh, and do a deep argument introspection there? And, and there was a session about this uh, yesterday where we talked about deep argument inspection for, uh, for SECOMP. Um, where this came up as well, uh, it's it's controversial in the sense that because you need an unprivileged LSM and whether we unprivileged eBPF LSM in this mm -hmm. specific scenario. And it's unclear whether this is ever going to happen because of reservations from the uh, from the eBPF maintainers um, and also from the LSM maintainers who don't want to expose too much internals for the LSM hook. So there, there's a bunch of issue, uh, issues. But also the issue is that we, we want mm, some of that filtering to be at the second layer, which is before the LSM hooks. And you might, like, we actually have cases with, because we've played with that feature quite a bit. Right. We, we totally implement syscalls that don't exist in Linux kernel. And that's yep. perfectly fine, because we can, we can do it. Secomp doesn't know yet whether syscall exists or not. We can uh, just have it and go to user space and pretend it does. Uh, so can I ask the reverse question? Uh, what about looking at make not itself? Right at the moment, the reason it doesn't work is because once you enter a user namespace, it's not NS capable, it's capable, so you're incapable right. of making any node. If we relaxed that and allowed the making of specific nodes that could be set by root, for which we had a whitelist in the kernel, yeah. wouldn't it obviate all of this? Unless you have a, r a real need for the oh no, it would have, yeah, first of all, there is a bunch for make node, it's true, it works. There is a bunch more. There's a bunch more syscalls yeah, uh, yeah. where we can't do this. Also, having the whitelist in kernel was frowned upon. Um, just whitelisting a bunch of devices, I've never heard that being acceptable, but, huh? In it module, right. there's a, yeah, sorry. In it module, there's a bunch of other syscalls, there's a bunch of other syscalls, exactly. Yeah. But like a, a um, simple example. One of the, one part of the solution that it could probably be done relatively cheaply that uh, um, at least the second maintainers haven't been opposed to is to be able uh, to tell the kernel to resume a syscall. Um, so you inspect the set, the whatever syscall you intercepted that, that you're interested in, um, and if you know that it would succeed anyway, the kernel would let you do it, then you just would let it uh, uh, let it pass through. Yes. Uh, so so but I, I was I was I was a bit confused by why this needs unprivileged GPF though, because if you have a central LSM that that does take care of the MAC policy for your MK not syscalls, you could have a whitelist as a part of the BPF program that is 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 checked in the uh, uh, in the MK not hook the kernel and then you can check whether this container is allowed to make MK not for this particular device, right? Like we nest containers. Yes. We run Docker inside LexD, for example. Okay. At yeah. which point the host of the Docker container is an unprivileged container itself, so it can't do okay. anything privileged. Okay. There okay. exactly there is also no uh, one should also note that um at the beginning, we worked under the assumption that we need um, deep argument inspection in a very generic way, ideally, for example, f for SECOMP or not necessarily SECOMP or an EBPF LSM or all uh, for all syscalls. Um, and I, I think we, we slowly have come to the agreement, especially in the case summit session yesterday, that this is that this is actually not what we want or what we need. We don't need like we we don't need path-based filtering, for example, for syscalls from that's LSM territory, and you want to filter on kernel objects anyway. You don't want to filter on strings that then get turned into other objects, and in the meantime, the meaning of the path in the relation to the kernel object might change, and so on. So, uh, but for example, where it would make sense is, is the obvious candidates, and I'm partially to blame for this, this is why I also had the case summit discussion, is clone three, for example, where you have the flag argument in a struct, or open at two, where you have the flag argument in a struct uh, two, or yeah, for those kinds of things where you also, where you have a struct where it makes totally sense to filter on it, uh, we could, for example, come up with a framework where you mark a syscall as filterable, then you copy the arguments, and then you have to do the second uh, deep syscall filtering. Um, and these are, I think, well, relatively low-hanging fruit. Okay, um, that's gonna be it for this one. We've got to, to switch to the next topic, uh, but I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about second later after this. Thank you.
Yeah, sounds working fine. Uh, yeah, you can probably just use this one for now until it fixes you. Oh, try again. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess it's, it's good. Okay. So, hello everybody. Oh. Okay. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Kam Server, and I will talk about uh, task migration at Google together with Michal Kwapiński here. So um, Google started using Q for migration uh, around 2018 and uh, we actually have presented at Linux Plumbers last year. Um, this presentation will uh, go over the improvements, our contributions and issues and concerns that we have encountered over the last year. Um, so one of the important, as we have a few assumptions uh, when running Crew. One, we don't want to run Crew as root. Um, Crew has a very big attack surface uh, for the user. It like, touches very exotic system calls, uh, inspects all of the uh, user process state, and it's um, because of this, it's prone for exploits. The easiest way to get rid of the problem is to just simply run crew with the same privileges as user, which way you don't have to worry about any ex exploit affecting crew. Another assumption is that. Mm -hmm. Just so I'm clear, your, uh, your worry is that the process being migrated could leak back into Creu and then cause a security breach. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the second assumption, which powerfully comes from the fact that uh, we don't want Creu running as root, is that we don't want to migrate the namespaces. The namespaces are, um, we are essentially we are migrating just the process tree within the namespaces. So uh, one reason is that setting up the namespace requires doing a lot of stuff which requires root privileges. And second thing is that we already manage the uh, namespace setup, uh, the namespaces uh, through the node agent of the cluster management system that we have. Um, and the last assumption is that we are aiming for migration finishing within minutes. So we are not aiming for a millisecond or further migration because right now we don't see a very good way to achieve that kind of uh, performance even for the just the blackout period and um, we found that generally the if we don't cannot deliver that generally our customers are fine with a minute long delays we don't want to uh, for it to take even longer because we don't want to hold up resources within the cluster okay so what's if you have seen the, our presentation from the last year, you may know that uh, our migration was going through storage. So we would first checkpoint to storage and restore from it. And now uh, this has been mostly replaced by a streaming direct migration from the source to the destination <laughs> host. We rely on the uh, 
through page server for doing the streaming migration with some added encapsulation layer. So essentially this, this is the way it looked before. We, the Creo page server would talk with uh, our internal migrator agent, which would put the, all the process data into the storage, and then at a later time, uh, migrator on a different host would pull the data from the checkpoint and again talk with the Creo page server. Well, in the direct streaming, it's, um, at the host level, it's uh, even simpler. There is some complexity at the cluster level where we need to make sure that the resources and the migrator agent is on the, is on the destination host uh, before the migration starts, but otherwise uh, it's relatively straightforward. So um, right now, actually our implementation allows us to, to be flexible whether we want to uh, migrate through storage or as a direct streaming solution, but actually this, um, has a slight complexity because um, with a direct streaming uh, connection, we could just encapsulate the page server protocol, but if we want to put it on storage, for which we don't have a file system like Access and we don't want to have temporary files on the, some local file system, we had to a bit reverse engineer the Creo page server protocol to acknowledge the receiving of the messages and then replay that communication on the destination host. Do you, um, do you use um, any encryption when doing the migration? Yes, okay. yes, both. So uh, the migration agent, um, like one of the responsibilities is uh, making sure that the uh, connection is encrypted and safe. Um, so one thing that would be nice if Creo um, would give a way to have the data received in a streaming manner without us uh, having to acknowledge the receiving of the data or if the protocol was an officially supported uh, protocol that we could feel safe to implement to, without uh, being afraid of it breaking in the future. So uh, now we'll talk more about our uh, contributions to Creo and as generally the experience with Creo. And we will start with the subreaper support, and uh, Micha will talk about that. Hi, hi. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, this is property. It's called child subreaper, and you can set it via PRCTL. Um, and migration of this property was uh, not supported in Creo before. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what exactly it is. Um, so normally if you don't have a child sub uh, if the green process dies, then, then the red process, its child, is going to get apparented to init. That's the regular behavior. And if you have a sub then if some, something dies below it, it's not going to get reparented to init, but to that sub -repair. And why is it uh, important for us? So if you don't have a sub -repair, then the orphaned processes get reparented to init, and then, since, as Camille said, we don't um, migrate the whole namespace, just the tree starting at, um, uh, at this uh, root process, um, then the orphan processes are not going to get migrated. They're going to they're going to get lost during the migration. But if you have the sub repair, then everything is going to get properly migrated since that process is below the sub repair in the tree. Mm. Okay, so um, I mean. It's generally it's pretty simple. Um, you run PRCTL, you issue PR get child sub repair, and then you use set child sub repair on the restoring side. So it should be easy, but it wasn't. Um, basically, um, I had to decide if I want to restore it before forking, before recreating the tree, or after. And 
I can do it before forking since sometimes I want to get, I want, we want to create processes that get orphaned and their parent is doing it. And restoring it before forking would break that. Processes wouldn't get orphaned properly. So maybe after forking. Well, also not exactly because, mm, because there's a bug in old kernels and that bug causes um, this property not to get properly, um, properly, uh, sorry? I think the word you're looking for is it's the, the property isn't properly propagated. Yeah, theoretically. I mean, it's not, uh, mm, it's not set in the children because the children are not sub repairs, but yeah, uh, they're not gonna get uh, the has child sub repair um, uh, variable. Um, so um, I had to decide bet between those two. I chose the second one. Uh, the bug was fixed in 2017. Uh, so newer kernel has uh, have that fix, uh, but if you're running the older kernel, uh, unfortunately, you're gonna have to update if you want to use this feature. And uh, I want to say thanks to Pavel Tikomirov, I hope I'm saying this right, um, because he fixed that bug. Okay, now uh, about C groups. Basically, crew handles C group migration just fine, um, but it uses CAPS store to Mount um, to mount the, the C groups. Um, it has to do that because uh, in other directories, that not every C group uh, might be mounted. There might be some missing. So basically, crew needs a, a clean a clean mounts. Um, and uh, since we don't want to give capsis restore to crew, uh, we've added a way to create the, the direction directory with mounts um, before starting crew, then pass the directory as a, a command line option to crew. Then after crew is done, we unmount everything um, and, and remove the deer uh, in a privileged process. Um. Another thing that we uh, liked in our interaction with crew is that um, we generally, during the migration, the uh, task on the destination host gets a different IP than the one on the source host. Generally, our users handle that well by just retrying the connections appropriately in the uh, library code. And um, we are happy that crew generally works well with this scenario uh, with appropriate configuration and um, we would like to stress that we would like for this to keep being supported and this being an important use case. Um, one part where we think that perhaps crew could, it could be a bit better <laughs> is uh, with the error messages that we are getting. Right now we need to parse the whole log from the migration to and try to deduce what was actually the kind of failure. We often would like to, for example, have some categorization, ideally some structuring, okay, where we should look for the error, what kind of an error it is. And uh, this is also perhaps a good occasion uh, to stress that we generally care about oh. uh, <laughs> We care about every failure and we want to get as much debugging info as possible. So like in, in doubt, if it is possible to get more debugging info from crew, we, we very much would like to see it. Um, one other feature that we, that wasn't, and I think is still not supported by crew is support for file descriptors with OPATH, uh, which is quite funny because crew itself uses OPATH file descriptors, but um, so maybe I, I should tell something about what are these file descriptors. So if you open a file with an OPATH flag, you get a, a bit of the generate file descriptor, which holds on information about the uh, resolved path. 
but actually you can do much with it. And in particular, Crew tries to learn too much using uh, SE and TLs uh, about it and it fails. So uh, we will be posting a patch soon which fixes this just by checking the, the OPA flag first. Um, and now I will talk about um, our request or experience with the checkpoint restore support in the kernel. So um, I have talked about the OPA file descriptors and actually another issue that we haven't really seen too much in the in production in the wild but uh, it's something that keeps us worried is that uh, for many virtual file systems kernel will keep some internal snapshots when the file is first opened and the reads would then go from this uh, buffer. This is obviously nice because it gives a nice consistent view of the file even if you do it in multiple reads. But the pro problem for the checkpoint restore is that one, it's hard to get this information. You could theoretically read through the file descriptor that is already opened even though uh, the files on the virtual file systems don't always necessarily work like that. But more importantly, you don't have at all any way to restore that state. Um, we don't have a very good proposal how to fix this. Perhaps either a direct API to, to put this data or maybe the virtual file systems could have some way to migrate them wholesale. I'm not sure. Um, Um, is this something that happens frequently with f some files? So uh, we haven't really seen that much in practice. Uh, I assume that probably that uh, because majority of the proc files can be read with a single read syscall, so uh, majority of users don't see the issue. But at the same time, we are afraid that um, we may be missing some problems because statistically, uh, users don't see that happen, but in reality they may get wrong data. Mm. Ah, uh, one thing here um, about PROC is that uh, while there are parts of PROC which are generally used and uh, important to users, there are other parts which on one hand potentially break the hermeticity by giving a lot of information about the host and it potentially would be nice to have a way to not show all the files in the proc. So kind of a limited view which is more uh, suited towards migration. Um, so one thing that we also encountered is that some interfaces are heavily restricted. So um, for example, I think map files requires the global CAPSIS admin the NS last bit in the, uh, the, it has a, it needs a namespace capsis admin, which is definitely much better, but still something that we would ideally get rid of. So uh, we, we think that for our use cases, these interfaces don't really affect security significantly. And we would be happy if we had a separate capability that we could just give to users and to crew. Uh, without having to give CAPSIS admin to them. So we have talked about time namespaces last year. We really, not that much has changed. I just wanted to reiterate that it's still something that we consider useful and uh, we would like to see. Right now we are working it around in libraries. And one thing that's uh, also important for us, if the time namespaces could isolate the timestamp counter register too. It would be very useful. Um, another issue is that there is a set of, there are some kernel interfaces which are effectively write only. For example, restartable sequences. I won't go into too much detail how they work, but essentially you can request some behavior from kernel but then you cannot inspect in any way what was actually requested. Similarly, for a cgroup v1 event API, you can register to get some events, but there's no way to discover what events have you registered for. 
This means that for users who want to use these libraries, we need to add support in the uh, libraries, which is unfortunate because ideally, as mentioned in the previous presentations, we would have Creo be transparent and not require users to access these APIs only through some approved libraries. And um, this ties into a bigger question of how do we make sure that the new interfaces that are being added to the kernel are suited for migration. <laughs> Generally, the, the features that make migration possible, being able to inspect what is the kernel state, I think are, mm, there wasn't a problem to merge them from what I know, but um, it's a bit sad that we kind of have to play whack-a-mole. Right? Okay, there is somebody who needs this feature. Actually, it's not migration uh, compatible and we need to improve the kernel. Ideally, we would either for every new feature have it done with migration in mind, but I'm not sure if this is feasible and how we would achieve this. Or alternatively, maybe we need some API to kind of, instead of having every separate feature, have a separate API to read the data, some way to dump opaque kernel data and then restore it on the other side. Um, actually, this is like, uh, I didn't know about the address, the kernel address space isolation work before, but I think that potentially this could feed into such an API if we have a clear separation, okay, these kernel objects are belong to some namespace, for example. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? So, you, you said your container manager yes. um, creates the namespaces on the destination machine. Yes. Is one of those namespaces a PID namespace? Yes. Does your container manager have any problem with giving your restore process root over that PID namespace? Uh, oh, I, I guess the what I mean. Cubs Say, say again? Cups is admin for the, over the PID namespace. Yeah, so if you create a user namespace, then create a PID namespace, you're not root on the whole machine, just, yes, yes, just, yes. just over, over your namespace. Yes, so we actually do that right now. We would prefer to have it reduced, but this is uh, a not bad situation right now, <laughs> the way we look at it. But uh, for example, I think at the, um, the map files interface, as far as I know, requires actually a global CAPSIS admin. And if it required a namespace CAPSIS admin instead of the global one, that would be a, a huge improvement for us. I, I don't remember what map files does, so I can't mm -hmm. comment right now. Uh, I can describe maybe. Uh, essentially, it allows to access file, uh, files which are mapped into memory. The main security concern there is that only a small region is mapped and through map files you can see the whole file if it's you have permission. More or less VMA to file. Yeah. Is it maybe PFN to file? VMA. Yeah, oh. VMA. Okay, I'm, I'm remembering a discussion. Yeah, well, if it's VMA to file, it's probably okay. I know there's another similar interface that was showing page frame numbers and stuff and it was useful to exploit um, Rowhammer. Okay. Uh, so, so, so you can see what, what other processes, where other processes were and say, oh, if I pound on this page of mine, it'll blow you up okay. and, and get security. Yeah. It's different. So yeah, okay. as far as I know, it's VMA. So. Yeah. yeah, so if it's just VMA, it should, should be fine. For uh, the NS capable. I think so, okay. I think so. Yeah. And what about the cap restore? to like um, fur further reduce the uh, capabilities given. Well, if you can do it as a user in a user namespace, you have fewer capabilities than what you would with a cap restore. No, no, uh, I guess we could have cap restore within the namespace too. Okay, yeah, and that, th 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 that, that could, you know, if, if the only thing that's really using that kind of functionality is re re um, checkpoint restore, that, that wouldn't be unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Might, might take work, but <laughs> yeah. Mm, any other questions? Um, 
Yes, but where were, where, where were the mics? <laughs> I just want to say a few words about time and space. We uh, were working on time and space last year. And now we want to think it will be a merge in the near future, maybe mm -hmm. next or maybe next next year on release. So, That's good so it's, it's we're near <laughs> the finish of this <laughs> work, but we don't know how, how, how much time we will need to merge. Uh, yeah, so my question, I may be showing my ignorance <coughs> here. Does Cryu try to checkpoint and restore processes at random time, or do they have to reach a safe point where you can save and restore them? Ah, uh, does it require coordination from the user of in those safe regions? Is that the question? Yeah, something like that. Yep. <coughs> Uh, so, no, however, we, uh, for users, we expose a migration notification API where they can register for an event uh, before the migration and we wait for them to kind of acknowledge that they are ready. So, for example, in some cases, uh, like if, um, if they want to do some lame duck or do something to make themselves more migratable, uh, this can be done within these so essentially pa uh, most of the workarounds in the libraries that we uh, have mentioned are done using such an API. Okay, before migration, let's either write down or change some stuff and then on restore, uh, first some fetch the information about the new host and only then actually continue execution. Right. Uh, one thing I was wondering about specifically is what happens if a process is executing in the VDSO, for example, when you try and migrate it? Um, do you yeah. only allow migration to an identical kernel or? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we haven't really solved that problem, but I think there's a presentation later about this problem and. Uh, yeah, I'm going to present uh, this problem or issue, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now that will be interesting. <laughs> Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, gonna be starting back up in a in a minute. Um, we also have like a pile of stickers on the table in front here for both the Lexity sticker and Creo stickers. If anyone wants, or if anyone's got other stickers they would like to share, you can put them all here. Um, hello everyone, um, today I'll be speaking about uh, secure imageless container migration. Um, I, just to introduce myself, my name is Rad Radustin. I just graduated from University of Aberdeen and I'm about to start my master's degree. Um, so one thing we were working on was basically to automate um, the way we transfer image files and to do that in a secure way. So um, the first step is to look at how the place pages daemon actually works. So when Creu um, does post-copy migration, we, we have to start a lazy pages daemon, which then um, is used to uh, handle user port FD um, 
interceptions. Um, when the dump site um, is, is being called, it creates a set of image files, and these image files have to be transferred over the to destination site, and they don't contain the memory pages, which is probably the largest, uh, in most cases, the largest part of uh, the checkpoint. Um, but it's still, um, it takes time to first start the lazy pages daemon and um, also to um, send all the image files. And if we want to introduce encryption, um, how do we do that? So one, one way is to pass a file descriptor. So we create a server, we pass the file descriptor to Creo, then Creo writes to this file descriptor. But then we have to read from the file descriptor and um, encrypt the data that will be um, sent over to the network. And then we have to basically decrypt the data on the destination site and then write it back to the file descriptor that Creo is using. So one way to optimize that is basically if we ask uh, Creo to do the encryption and decryption. And this is basically the idea that we wanted to introduce. Um, so basically Creo um, is using a certificate of installed on the host itself and then um, performs the exchange. And once the authentication is complete, it um, just um, encrypts the data and encrypts on um, when sending memory pages. Um, so in order to enable TOS, the first step is to basically uh, install the set, to generate certificates and install them. And then you basically, you just have to add the TOS command line option and everything else should just work as it used to. Um, the next step is basically how to automate the transfer of image files. So there was a previous work from Rodrigo Bruno who implemented um, image cache and image proxy, which is a way to basically create a proxy server on the source site and a cache server on the destination site. Both create a Unix socket and then the dump writes to, Creo dump writes to this Unix socket. Um, image proxy will basically read from the socket and will send the data over to image cache. Um, image cache will keep the data in memory buffer and then when the restore site connects through the Unix socket, it will read the data back. Um, the problem here is that we have a performance overhead. We basically write the same data once to the image proxy uh, <coughs> cache buffer, then this will be sent through um, over the network to image cache, and this will be written again, and then um, Creo Restore will basically read the data one more time. So it, it's not very efficient way of doing that. And um, this is how you can actually use image cache image proxy. You basically have to start the cache daemon and the proxy daemon, and then um, you basically pass uh, the remote option to dump and restore. And then instead of writing to files, it will basically always write to this Unix socket or read from the Unix socket. Um, and the way we want to optimize that is by um, using a single TCP connection. So when you start Creo Restore, um, it will create a TCP server. And then with Creo Dump, you can basically um, connect to this uh, TCP server and send all the data that you basically send the images rather than saving them to files. You can basically send them over the network and we already have the TOS encryption, so um, we can basically, instead of using send, you, we can use GNU TOS to encrypt the data. Um, and the way you can use that is basically um, by adding the, the port option to 
to you restore, and this would create the actual server. And then with dump, you can um, use port and address to connect. Um, and the way we implement, we could implement pre-copy migration is by using pre-dump. So one thing is that pre-dump, what it does, it's actually creating an inventory image. It's creating um, checkpoint of the memory pages. And so all other images are not, um, they, they're not being tracked currently. So what we have to do is basically we have to transfer the memory pages to the next destination site. And then if we have another call of pre dump, then we receive another instance of the memory pages. If some memory pages have been changed, then we can basically overwrite the existing one on the destination side. So we don't need to keep the parent relationship between previous dumps. Um, and when the final dump is uh, performed, then the restore process can continue. And the same could be done with uh, PS socket. So uh, we, we, we can just pass a file descriptor and then the remote side, instead of creating a, a a socket and then um, performing everything with it, it would just use the file descriptor that was passed. Um, and so the challenge here is how do we handle the special image files? For example, the temporary file system, it's currently like a, a you call star and tar creates a zip file, well, um, a terrible and then this is the actual image. So this image has to be transferred to the destination site. And the problem here is that we don't know how much space we need um, in order to allocate it. So the way this is currently implemented is by writing to um, image proxy in a set of buffers. And then after the write is complete, we know how much space we, we have used. And then we can send that to image cache um, so probably this would be the way to solve it, like um, writing in a set of buffers and then when we start reading it, we know how much space we, we need. Um, and the other challenge it was basically how to um, replace or rather merge um, dump, um, dumps of memory pages. So we have to identify the memory pages that have been um, modified and replace them with the new version and then keep a single instance of every memory page. Um, and the last step would be to implement, um, basically to integrate it with lazy pages daemon. And this would be, um, the idea here is to have something called hybrid copy migration, which is you perform several iterations of pre-dump, and then at the end you do post-copy migration. And um, all memory pages that have not been, um, have been modified and, ha and have not been sent in the last step um, will be requested on demand. Um, so the, the idea is that lazy pages daemon is currently running um, as a separate process and it's creating its own uh, TCP socket. So the way we can integrate um, the remote option with lazy pages daemon is by um, basically reusing the same socket that was already established. So we fork and create the daemon again, but this time uh, it's just using the socket from the remote option. Um, and this is from me. Um, thank you. And these are some of the links to um, my current work. Do you have any questions? So for, for the integration with the lazy pages, uh, I've started to look at it once again, some time ago, but I kind of hadn't more time. Uh, you can uh, 
works the lazy pages from inside Creo and use socket pair to communicate between main Creo and the lazy pages. And then uh, if you fork it late enough, it you can inherit the TCP socket from uh, from the original Creo uh, that you were creating for images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so besides the future work, um, is this already? Oh, I see. There's a pull request for all this, right? Uh, well, the pull request is actually for TOS, for the TOS support. Like the link is for and TOS. The, support. And the Im image less migration, the combination of image proxy and image. It's image currently on this um, okay. on this branch. Okay, I'm still working so it's on still it. Still research. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I was going to say, so, but the, so in terms of container types to use it and so on and so on, the long-term goal is going to be that um, we would switch to this and then we would just have one socket for all communication between the two hosts when doing a migration, right? Well, yeah, okay. uh, you have a single TCP socket that you can just use. Okay. Neat, sounds good. Um, Andre, do you have any comments about this? Um, do you think we should? So uh, I want to say that we have actually on only one problem with tempo effect, how we dump tempo, tempo effect. Uh, the problem with uh, IP addresses and roles, it, it can be easy solved if we will dump uh, if we will dump roles and addresses uh, in Creo instead of running IP2. Yes. Yeah, so. It's okay. So the only challenge is TMPFS and how do we solve it? Yeah, that? and we can think how we can. Uh, right now we use uh, tar to dump TMPFS to files and yeah. content of TMPFS mount, but actually we can implement something in Creo to, to dump TMPFS and just. Yeah, we, just we will not need to start tar, and we can use our own protocol for this, and we will remove this dependency too. Okay. So the, problem with, so the problem with tar is that uh, on the receive side, you don't know how big the tempfs mount needs to be. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, it's kind of like that. Like you, you basically don't know how much space you need to allocate. So um, you can create like a small buffer. The way we currently solve that is by creating a small chunks and then re keep receiving until um, um, until we f until tar finished, and then basically we just read from the buffer when we're stored. Oh, because you stream tar, you don't. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Because I was going to suggest why not send the size ahead of time, but it's because you stream it, so you don't know what the size will be. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that everything? Or? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hey, hey, yeah, that was it. <laughs> you have it right here. Thank you. So it's now in the big stack.
We also need to ask about how to use, uh, how we can, how Mount API can help with containers. So here's a rough example of how the new Mount API works. You open a file system and then you set configuration parameters using a new, some new system calls. You create a mount point and then you move it into place. I, I've missed out some parameters here. This is just a rough illustration to make it easier to understand what I'm going to talk about next. So the, the first thing is w with the new FS config system call, it gives us the opportunity to do things like add uh, UID and group ID, trans user ID and group ID translation tables to a mount point, for Earth to a new super block or to a mount point as we uh, create it before anyone else gets to see it. So that when, when people, other people can see the, uh, the published mount, it is already set up. There are translation tables in place. And the, what I'm trying to do is make the translation be done by the VFS, so you don't need something like ShiftFS to mount on it to do the translation for you, because mounting uh, an intermediate uh, file system has some efficiency issues. So James is about to disagree with me. No, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just asking, yeah. where are you doing the translation? Because we have to do the translation underneath the file system, not on top, because the user namespace does it on top. Yeah, we've been discussing that with Eric. And there are two points of translation that we can deal with. One is actually in the file system, so we can ins install a translation table on the super block that translates device IDs K, uh, KU IDs and back again. That's one possibility. And the other is to add an extra uh, translation table into the user namespace where you can put uh, translations from particular user KU IDs to other KU IDs. And then we would look this up at. Uh, yeah, we can, get, we can cache, cache these in certain places like the credentials. Have you got a mic in the microphone? Yeah, so if you, you know, the, the credential, since it's just this, w only represents w one point of translation, you can yeah. cache the translation if you only have, um, you have it in the either namespace. If it, if it helps, so, so, so I have a picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is what I was thinking of uh, before I talked to Eric about it at lunchtime. Yeah. Just before lunchtime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the challenge is we, you know, if, if these represent, if these would be like the struct cred for the, those guys. Yeah. They do it, you do, do the translation in here between yeah. the KUIDs of the file system. So, so, but we might want to put an asymmetric, an asymmetric translation over here, so that if, so, so if you do Mecta, it uses that mm. translation. But if you're reading this file with that or file with that, it translates it to that. So that uh, you can have files with different UIDs appearing as the same UID in the container. But if you create something, you know exactly what it's going to be later on. So when it appears on the medium. So what, what Eric was that that's the superblock translation there there. But Eric was suggesting that we need another translation layer here because these may be actually represented by different KU IDs, and I didn't realize this when I made the diagram. So, anyway, th th this is a possibility we're looking at. Looks like it has potential. I don't think yeah. we have have any code for any of this yet, right? Uh, just borrow this, just the stuff that's already in the user namespace. Okay. That we could hopefully look, make use of. Yeah. For this. So, so that that's the potential of the Mount yeah. API. API. Yeah. Did you ha ha have more you want to talk about yeah. uh, th 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 than the um, translation possibility? Yeah, because well, another thing that occurs to us, if you've got 
a translation table on the superblock. But these do not have to be U32s. These could be name strings, so like you get from NFS, or they could be, say, UUIDs, like you get from SIFS. So this could be a blob rather than a number. And that would make it easier to translate, potentially make it easier to translate very foreign user IDs from a network file system. So your plan is to replace the NFS UID translation daemon as well? Not necessarily. That could add translations to the table, potentially. Okay, well, I get it's theoretically possible. We still have to see it work in practice. So anyway, any further yeah. comments on this bit before I move on to the next? So this, uh, this would mean, just to clarify, I think we, we already established this, but this would mean it's not actually tied to a user namespace. You could also make use of this translation mechanism independent of user namespaces because right. there are a lot of... Yeah, there so there are, are two translation mechanisms and you can use one or both of them. Cool, yes. Yeah. And one of them is tied to user namespaces, the other isn't. Well, so there is, this, this is a use case, a specific use case, so um, the, you can chime in there as well if you want. Um, so this comes, for example, from, uh, from Systemd, where uh, they want to basically have a home directory on a USB stick mm -hmm. that you can portably carry around to different yeah. computers. And the UAD and GAD mappings that are actually on the USB stick, for example, don't really matter. You just plug it in and then... S yeah. In this case, system D would gain logic to automatically translate it to whatever t transit uh, uh, UID or GID uh, the system gives you in on. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Exactly. I, so I, was, I was thinking more of uh, your 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 computer, your, your computer, and you, there's a server over there, and you've been allocated a user ID on it. And uh, you so translate that to your own user ID. So this is, is a hope, uh, it's probably fine to talk about this, but this is actively being worked on in, in Systemd. Um, mm -hmm. And so the way they're doing it right now is think that the, the solution they have for this, if you want to do something like this, is just rec brutally recursively chone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so this would let you get around all of these limitations. So yeah, th that, would, that would be the mapping, I think, if I understand, on the super block. And that would <coughs> And what we're talking yes. about is something roughly equivalent to generalizing NFS's um, user ID sure. mapping so they, it can be yeah. used with more file systems. Yes. Yeah, all, all FAT's one as well, right? Uh, I'm not sure FAT has no, no, user IDs, uh, but... Is it FAT? Uh, no, I think... No, NTFS, sorry. N um, NTFS, NTFS, yeah, they yeah. have uh, UID or GUIDs. Yeah, 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 so yeah. same thing, but yeah. Um, generalized, yeah. So, it, yeah, it makes sense to have a generalized layer. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. that, that, that goes to the file systems. Um, now, the, that doesn't solve the many to one problem we need for a shared route. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it solves the, the rest of them. So it. That was the other translation yeah. table. Yeah. yeah. The one over this side. That I haven't actually got on the diagram. So, any other comments on this before I move on? Beep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, how to uh, make use of uh, the mount API to do unprivileged mounts inside a container. We have a file descriptor, fs mount, uh, sorry, fs open gives us a file descriptor with a, an, uh, an object inside the kernel attached that when you do fs config, fs config, fs config, it attaches the parameters to the object in the kernel. You then call fs mount to actually create your mount point. At that point, the possibility exists that we could talk, suspend the process that's doing the mount and talk to the container supervisor, whatever that happens to mean, <coughs> and say, here's, the file descri here's a file description pointing to FS conte uh, context, the, the object in the kernel. Tell me whether I can allow this or I should reject it. And also, you can make alterations to it so that you can set certain parameters. You say you must have that parameter. <coughs> so FS info is something you haven't seen yet. It's been pushed a few times, but it's not up to speed yet. That allows you to look inside the context oh. and read the parameters from it. FS config is the same as before. You can, so you can set parameters, delete parameters. D d d 
this is basically the mount equivalent of the second notifier of the <laughs> to, to, be, yeah. to, to some extent, yes. Yeah. Sorry, you went around. Um, yes, so this would be an up call, right? We uh, yeah, so yeah. So basically, I, I, I say to the money, the kernel says to the manager, attention needed, and somehow we get the file skip to, to the manager when he asks for it, and the manager says yay or nay and possibly amends the thing, and it can right. re read the parameters. I guess the question, I have a question which is, would there be a plan to make it so that you can um, uh, filter down? Because the, the downside is that, sorry, with SecComp user notify, you couldn't filter this, even if we had deep syscall inspection, because you have an FD, not a struct, that you can yeah. inspect. So I guess the question is, is that... Fil so filtering what? What do you mean by filtering? As in, you could say that um, you mean I, only, I only want to be able to do special operations on some on some yeah, Are you talking about with S SecComp? Filtering. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is that... Uh, because because this is not using seccomp, this is going to use an up call or something like yeah. that, like a different mechanism. My point is that uh, is that is there a plan to make it so, for instance, you could make it so that it, you filter, so you say so I only want to get an up call for these particular oh, uh, mounts or something like that. I hadn't considered that. That would be a possi distinct okay. possibility. Right. Yeah. Because this is right. you couldn't do. The yeah. point is you couldn't emulate this with seccomp yeah. if you could filter it on file system <coughs> because there isn't a way yeah. to do it uh, with, with seccomp. I, 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 but that is yeah. there is, isn't there? Because we can get access, as long as we know the PID that instigated this, we can get Proxys PID, and you're privileged enough, Proxys PID FD. So you get can get hold of the FD as long as you know its number. Oh, right, right no, sorry, what, what I mean is that, um, no, no, sorry, you right. could do it, but you couldn't emulate in-kernel filtering, because um, uh, I, even with, even with... I, uh, could I could provide in-kernel filtering. Yeah, I, yeah. I was just, I was just asking, as in, is there an idea to have something like that? Yeah. It but it would require support from the file systems, probably. Because uh, to, to do anything other than file system type and probably file system uh, source, mm. because the parameters are, uh, are effectively compiled down into okay. this the is file system. In, ID. in general, I like uh, in general I like the idea, but it points to me. Maybe I'm just thinking wrong, but it points to a more pressing problem that we have, and I'm not sure if you're going to address it on the next slide, which is before we have supervised and privileged mount, which is very advanced. Mm. We should probably have a way to mount across namespaces, mount namespaces. I have no problem with that. Mount namespaces, could they do that? Uh, so this no. is really a problem uh, right now. I mean, we the, the, the problem is not technical. It's Al. He doesn't like the idea of doing this. No. Mount move doesn't move. Really no. Mount Sorry. move will not move across namespaces. No, but I. But what can't you do? So, last time I looked at this API, it supported this. You do the thing that creates the, the anonymous namespace, yeah, and then you mount move it yeah, into well another namespace. Yeah, well, you, well you, you clone it, and then you yeah, attach well, it. When I first did this, I had it so you could mount into another namespace. I was taking that away. He thinks that's a security hole or something. I'm not quite sure. And we, the thing is, the thing is, from a from a container's perspective, that's something we really need. Yeah. Uh, b and because right now we have like hacky workarounds, so it's it's possible to do this abusing mount propagation. Okay. Um, so it's it's also it's it's unclear why this would be a security issue if you can do it uh, uh, through mount propagation. Actually, this was regressed uh, because of the new mount API, uh, which you and Al fixed after I reported it. So he seems apparently fine <laughs> that this is possible. Okay. Right. So mount propagation, you have you, you have a basically you have a shared mount path that you set up uh, before you start the container. Uh, then you mount on the host side onto that shared mount point, and then inside of the container you do a mount move. Ah. At which point you have to mount in a container, you can unmount from the host, and you have injected a mount into a container. But that's really, I mean, that's really hacky, right? It yeah. would be way nicer if the container manager, without the container having had a shared, basically a tunnel into the host, could just say, yeah. give me a mount in there. Because yeah. when I first did this, you, uh, you was with the kernel container object, which various people objected to, but what's it like? You got the file descriptor from that, and you could mount using that as, as in place of AT, FD, CWD, so that the, using a move mount, you use a path of the file descriptor plus the direct file, base direct file descriptor of the path. And so you could use that to mount loads of things into the, the mount tree referred to by the container object. So if I've got a file descriptor representing a mount, uh, a mount namespace, I don't personally see any reason why I shouldn't be able to use move mount to move new mount into that. Well, Al doesn't like it. So he, he, here's my question. 
and I'm maybe I'm completely confused um, because I know this code looked like it supported this earlier. Um, is if you do w whatever the copy tree thing is that that, that creates you, you a floating set of mounts yeah. in its anonymous mount names space. I think that's right still. Yeah. I don't yeah. exactly follow the anonymous name well, the space thing, but well, th th that's what it does, so it doesn't yeah. ha have other yeah. bugs. Um, but yeah, it's this yeah. floating set, set of mounts that are mm -hmm. attached to your file descriptor that aren't attached to anything real. Yeah. Um, and then you take that file to, s and then you like set nest into your mount namespace, and then you move mount onto your current mount namespace. That should, I think, that works. Yeah, I suppose that would work. Because what I was thinking of, you shouldn't, shouldn't need to do the set and S necessarily. Yeah, but the thing yeah. is, the set, the set and S is the, is the part which is effectively like the MS move thing. It's the same idea, which is that you, um, you're, you're joining the namespace. As in, is there a way to, to inject it without jo joining the namespace? Mm. Well, Basically, your, your original idea was, right, you, for example, you specify a, uh, specify a mount namespace by passing in an FD or something. Yeah. Well, right. so, uh, uh, the alternate is, it, it, is you just pass the FD that represents the mounts between processes. Um, to the process. Sure. Yeah. Um, the, the with what I'm talking about here, the mount I mean is actually done inside the container, yeah. and then the FD is passed back to the th the, th uh, the manager, who can then read the parameters and say yes or no. Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Just so I'm clear, this can all be used on binds, right? So we can use arbitrary parts. Yes, of the it can work on binds too. So where is the FS? Uh, so oh, the FS config yeah. information has to be persistent. Where do we persist it? It's in the context. Well, FS info will read from a context or, an I or a live super block. Yeah. Right, but once I pass the config to the mount, yeah. right, the file descriptor is gone. How does the mount gain access to the tables and everything else? Where is the information actually stored? Because for a bind mount, you have no super block to store Actually, it yeah, I'm not sure. You and I can make can it handle bind mounts, currently we don't, because I can create well, that, the that was the whole problem ShiftFS was created for. We, if yeah. we have a super block, we can easily fix this, but we, yeah. for doing most bind mounts, we don't have a super block, so we can't fix it. That's why we needed ShiftFS. Because with, with bind mounts, what if you do, you do call fspick, which gets you a, pr uh, a configured uh, so a file system, and then you do move uh, FS mounts, move mounts off that. So if you can solve the problem, uh, so the, the reason we did shift FS is because it basically is a bind mount with a super block yeah. and we can then hang information off the super block which includes the tables. Yeah. If you can find a way of hanging the yeah, information. Well, FS, there's another system, you saw FS open on the example. Instead you do FS pick and mm -hmm. say this directory. Yep. Then you call FS mount to c which creates you a new mount to the same place and you, s you specify where in that uh, the thing you're looking at you want because a uh, uh, bind mount can get you a part for a sub, uh, a sub mount of a mount so, F so FSP will get you a sub mount and that will get this FD you can do that and then this, this sort of thing and then you can use that to reconfigure it or you can call FS mount and then so you can skip, that's right, FSP, right. ignore these two lines, FS mount. But when you mount. call this uh, yeah. FS mount, so effectively you've lost the information in the file descriptor mm -hmm. because it's been transferred to the mount itself. How but FS info will read it from the super block if you have a super block. If, it, if the super block isn't there, it will read it from the parameters stored in the, in the, stored in in the, the object, the FS context object. So you have to keep the FS context object right, alive. So uh, the FD is still alive. All the way through, you're still, still alive here. That, All the way that through should to be, that should be our internal FD. Sorry. Okay, so if, we st so if the FD is the carrier of the information, yeah. that should So that, that, yeah. But and that's the complexity. That's the reason we needed ShiftFS. That was the complexity. And what David and I were sketching, um, um, who were talking privately, was it looks like we can get this down to just needing one bit on, on, on in the VFS mount that says, use this alternate translation table. And, um, oh, for the UID thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for, for the UID mapping thing. And so that, you know, we, you know, so, so it, it might, yeah. might, might be very reasonable to do it with very little space. Yeah. And we, we got down to that because we need, need to be able to cache things if we were gonna use override cred. Because if you don't cache it, 
known RTU problem. Yeah. Yeah, everyone's happy okay with that. We'll, I've got one more slide. Yeah. I'm sorry. So the thing is, uh, default parameters for roof blocks. So one of the problems we've got with auto mounts is you don't get a chance to parameterize an auto mount. When you make an ordinary mount, you give mount load of parameters like, for instance, with NFS, you've got timeouts, window sizes. You can't do that with auto mounts. Or at least uh, you can if you use auto FS, but not if it's an auto mount you step on inside another, uh, inside an NFS thing, because you may cross domain, and then the, dom the new domain may have, you may want to give it completely different parameters, but you can't. So what I'm proposing is that we provide a way to load, either preload or upcall for parameters for super blocks. So you can say, if you see this amount for this super block, so you say to the kernel, if you uh, this type of file, this uh, source, use these parameters, set, set these parameters as the default. Question is, if I'm doing that, should I load them? You load them in advance, say at boot, into the kernel, or does the kernel load them on demand? So either up call or go and actually read a file would be the bit oh. there. But uh, no, no. Uh, if you're doing it to boot, the boot would say, "Here's a, a rule. Here's a rule. Here's a rule. Here's a rule." Perhaps through a slash sys something, something somewhere. Probably, if you want to do something on demand, yeah. the thing that makes sense is to like create the mount someplace where um, you can get at it with FS config, set, uh, send a notification to user space, and user yeah. space use the Yeah, that's tool. one possibility, yeah. yeah. Um, same as the previous thing. Yeah. The, the rules on it is, uh, here you are, please give me default parameters. That's the po one possibility, yeah. So would this be useful in for containers too, this sort of thing, particularly for unprivileged mounts? You preset the defaults, and then you can rule on it again later. I don't know for uh, for containers, but this again seems like something that might I interest uh, something that is in a system, mm -hmm. um, because they have much more use for this than I, I guess the the container case. Um, yeah, and mount notifications. I I, I keep hearing uh, some some part of me thinks I think so. I, I I've been hearing people wanting better mount notifications. To know when a mount happens, so people can do something. I have right, something so to do with that. So <laughs> I don't have a slide um, of it. Ab absolutely, for yeah. sure. Um, uh, for sure, uh, mount notification would be uh, uh, would be really helpful. Um, and also, if I'm not mis, right, especially also doing it recursively. Yep. That would be really helpful because we currently we have no easy mechanism. You could probably try to do it the with a fan notify, right? Uh, that doesn't do the recursive case, I think. I think they uh, they recently yeah. enabled something like this, but the problem is it requires you to be capable capsis admin. But oh. there are three checks yeah. that ask yeah. for a capable capsis admin, and uh, last I talked to them, they were like, eh, we're not sure we want to remove this check. So yeah. Uh, yeah, if this could be done with the mount API. Because what with the mount, because the reason, so uh, with the mount notification stuff and the mount API, you can set a notification on the thing you've got from FS mount before you call move mount. That means if anything happens once it's attached to the mount tree, you start seeing your notifications immediately. There's no gap where you miss notifications because you've got a, a mount, uh, you've got a watch in place already. Yeah, with with the recursive thing, with the mount notifications that I've got, you, you place a, a watch on a directory, and everything in the subtree from that directory out to the tip will generate notifications that you can collect. Mm, excellent, yeah. But that would, be def that would definitely be something that we, uh, we, could make, yeah. uh, we could make use of. And this is general, again, this is generally useful to anything that watches other processes or managers, managers yeah. processes. Well, that's the end of my slides. Any other comments, questions, <coughs> desires? Specifically about uh, about ShiftFS. So uh, another reason why uh, we we picked up James' uh, initial work on on ShiftFS and and made it work. Huh? Okay.
Okay, uh, was based, well, the, se the next session is exactly about this. So, uh, was obviously also the, 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 uh, the time frame. Um, we've been wanting Shiftifus for a long, long time, and of course the approach that you suggest right now wouldn't have been possible before the new yeah. mount API landed, so it's more of sort of an what sort of time frame can we talk That's about? That's a good question. Probably minimum of two cycles, I suspect. Oh, not the six months. I, I mean, that's, that's fine as long as it's, it's not. Yes, because we, we have to implement it, and then it probably has to sit in Linux for an extra cycle. Yeah. Minimum. And as long as it's not a minimum of two sure. years. Sure, and, it's and it's yeah. need, it needs reviews, but it would, would probably, in terms of <coughs> speed, it would probably be good if you were the one to do it, because you're sitting at the source. I'll add it to my list of other things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's on my list to do. Uh, I might need to lean on Eric to do that side of it while I do that side of it. And I can do the configuration bits. Yeah. yeah. Which kernel version did this actually go into? The uh, Mount API. Yeah. Five two. Uh, two versions ago, I think. So five one or five two? Yeah. Five, five one. one. Yeah. I'm just checking. Yeah. Seven used this calls, I think, right? I think only five of them have gone in so far. Oh, right. <laughs> Anything else? I think we're probably out of time. Uh, I mean, I have a Mount API question. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to FS pick a file descriptor? As in, is do you have to have a path? Is there a way to uh, it, it has a path and a uh, file, uh, file name and AT, uh, look, uh, the AT types. Oh, okay. Out of time now. Okay, yep. yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, the Mount API was really needed. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I guess. Uh, James, is to sort of do, do you want to present something, or is it just more of an I open discussion? Okay. I have nothing to present. I was just actually going to discuss what we needed to do, and now I'm not sure what we need to do. <laughs> so we can, do we want to have a discussion, or can we? I, I think it's more or less. Uh, it's so uh, I think the only thing we need to a ask the question of is, do we still need SysFS for anything, or a ShiftFS for anything, or is it done? I, I, I it's think it's with... Yet, I but well, it's not that in a sense. Once we have that, and this uh, I think is the way to go, uh, uh, these uh, it uh, it should be it should be fine, and we don't need ShiftFS anymore. So the problem uh, with why I think ShiftFS is problematic, and wh where's Seth? Seth is here. Uh, he, you can come up because he's been doing that work together with me. Okay. So, um, and so we we ran into a bunch of we ran into a bunch of issues. <coughs> so for example, this is an obviously an overlay FS. Uh, an overlay file system, and now think. Uh, I guess the most prominent case that comes to mind is ButterFS. We uh, run containers uh, in ButterFS, and ButterFS allows you, as an unprivileged user inside of the user namespace, to create subvolumes and delete subvolumes if mounted with the correct mount options, and do snapshots and so on. Now, if you have ShiftFS on top of this, on top of this, this all breaks because if you do an IOCTL, which bypasses all of the F VFS permission checks. Uh, then uh, ButterFS gets confused and it's like, no, you're not capable in the initial user namespace. Uh, you don't get to create uh, a ButterFS subvolume, regressing a bunch of use cases, for example, Docker that runs in user namespaces using ButterFS. So what we had to do is, and I'm ashamed to admit this, but what we had to do is, for example, a at the time of the IOCL, you basically switch out the DFD for a DFD of the underlying ButterFS file system so that the IOCL goes through. And all of that stuff should would not be necessary, in my opinion, if we had ShiftFS properly in the VFS. Um, because that should just work out of, uh, out of the box. Also, if you wanted to use OverlayFS on top of ShiftFS, which again, if you run Docker inside of the user namespace, then OverlayFS is basically you telling you get away because you're a remote file system because you have a revalidate method. So we had to hack into overlayFS, again, I'm sorry, uh, uh, to special case shiftFS. Um, and then also, <laughs> uh, 
remote file system, remote file systems such as uh, well, overlays as itself uses DFS data to stash information inside of a entry. So if overlay FS opens, uh, uh, creates a, f a fake path uh, that then gets uh, passed down into uh, ShiftFS, now ShiftFS is looking at the Dentry information and is really confused. What the hell is in this Dentry? This is overlay FS information, not ShiftFS information crashing, which means uh, uh, we needed to change overlay FS to <laughs> pass down the correct Dentry into ShiftFS. So we, we need to change, it came to the point where we needed to change a bunch of file systems, the ones people cared about. Overlay FS, uh, we needed to do this ButterFS hackery, um, and sort of, yeah, it's, it's very nasty. Um, and with a VFS approach, if this would all be gone. In the end, what I'm trying to say is, if you don't want to regress use cases and want to have ShiftFS really usable, I, I think uh, we can upstream it. Like, this is not upstreamable. The, the way, what, at least what we had to do. Um, unless we did it in such a wrong way and there is an obvious other solution to all of these problems, but yeah. I, I think you said it all. Um, I, some of the, I mean, the basic shift FS is is fine. Um, right. But it's those dirty hacks to get some of those other use cases working that just, you know, they'd never fly upstream, I don't think. So yeah. the plan going forward is to see if we can uh, redo it around the mount, new mount API. Yes. Okay. At that point, point then, I, I, I better bring up what we were talking about um, uh, between David and I and see, see, see how many holes you can poke in it. <laughs> oh, um, so, so I think he's just told us we have no path forwards if you poke holes in this, so be careful what well, you wish for. <laughs> well, I figure uh, if we poke the holes early, um, we, we, we might, might get out of them before we sink the boat. Um, and I'm going to, yeah. if, if I can... This URL, by this URL, by the way, is in the uh, the description of the session. So you, everybody can just go to the session description where the timetable for the session is. Click on it. Okay. So I'm I, I, I'm trying to replicate the diagram. I, I was using, as I thought about this while talking to David. Um, so start with two containers. Um, inside UID inside the first container translates to KUID 5000, the other one KUID 6000. Um, and, okay, that's good. Um, Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Move with that. Um, so, uh, so, um, so, um, yeah, you, 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 you want parts of it that, that, that you want all, all the fun. fun you want, want the shared part of stuff, but I, I'm thinking, I always think think of it as read only, that um, you want to be, you know, have multiple mappings too, and then you have the other places where, where, where you want the right to, and you don't want, want special matching. Um, um, what, what I was thinking is you have your, in, in your user namespace, you have your ordinary map, and you have your, for life, life, possibly bare term, a shared map, and um, and these would be inodes, and these would be creds. Um, and so, what you could do is um, have an additional add a shared map to the user namespace. Um, so would this be would this be the user namespace used at the top or the user oh. namespace of the super block? The user namespace for the containers. So what do we do if we have a super block namespace as well as a user namespace? 
um, that the, 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 that 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 just goes to how these KUIDs. So this is going to be a generate. private translation in here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a file system specific translation from files on disk to KUIDs. So, you know, and, and, and when you and you when you mount your USB stick, you really care care about that right. translation and ha how it's going to work. And we probably want to make a general layer, but for the the container case, we we want want the one to many. So this file. Goes to both of those and looks like a, a UID owned by UID zero. Yep. Um, so, got as far as that. You know, now, with what the shared map lets us do is if we have a bind mount there. Um, you know, we just have a bit that says you use your darn shared map um, on the bind mount, um, and then and then we can cra cache a second cred here that says. That if you're shared, you know, a, a shared cred, and your existing cred that goes to KUID 20, you override cred and use that one when accessing um, through the bind mount. So I, can we not be more simple? Is there any need for a shared map? Because the statement is we we're, we're fictitious root to real UID. We want to write or read back from fictitious root again. <laughs> we always reverse. We're the only use case I could ever find uh, ShiftFS was when we were reverse mapped. Oh, I oh. Yeah, um, so my, my expectation is UID, well, okay. Um, so th 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 there might be a way to optimize this, yes. Um, you know, because everybody wants to go to the same UIDs in their container. There might be a way to optimize that. I, you know, and that's very, but, but this caching here is fundamental. Um, big, um, and so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm all open to the simplification you were suggesting. Um, I was think, I, I actually was um, had had a sim similar thought on my my way in, in here today. Um, okay, but, but th this is just an implementation detail. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, the yeah, point yeah, is, yeah. W we have to convince Al to give us an additional flag in the VFS mount. That's well, the problem. VF well, a flag versus a data structure, much easier. Um, I, I've added several. <laughs> are, are you talking about VFS mount? Yeah, 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 yeah. It needs one bit in a VFS mount that says, go use that map. Um, and, uh, you, 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 the, the hard part um, to convince Al and everybody of is the, in every, in every syscall, especially open, um, adding an override cred to that one instead of that one. Um, when, when at the syscall layer, we're, we're going in and doing that. And we, so I was gonna ask, we construct the override cred on the fly or we have it available? We cache it in, in, the, in, the, in the cred. Okay, so from the cred we can go yeah. to, okay, and, you know, nice. and that, keyed on the same flag. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that's the advantage of putting it in, in our user namespace because we only have one. So may, if you have two or three file systems, that you want this mapping to apply to, you know, the shared mapping in your namespace, they all have to have the same U UID <coughs> mapping, but I don't think that's a real limitation. This uh, isn't very expensive though, right? Uh, I mean, if at open time, if we have to override cred, so what is your? Override cred is cheap. Generating a cred is expensive. Yes, okay. And so this that's is, the we cache That's why the, the caching is, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and, and this is a, th we follow a pointer and we put it in the task struct. Um, I must admit. Thank you very much. Destroying the In many ways, destroying the cred is actually the worst bit because it gets deferred, and so you can uh, wangle your system by doing something that does create loads of creds, bang, 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 and then try and destroy them, bang, bang, and then they just eat memory and eat memory and eat memory until eventually the RCU uh, thing, thing, the RCU cleanup runs. And if you're not careful, you could actually run out of memory. We had this problem with access yeah. recently. Um, and I have a question about, uh, I'm, this might be obvious, but um, uh, I presume this can catch multiple, because obviously if you have something from here mounted here as well, um, how do you know which cred well, to use? Well, I saw it's going to ask, so where uh, is the cache? So this is, in your cred, you have a cache 
Okay. It, the, the thing that makes this fast and simple and cheap is in your cred, you have a pointer to another cred. That is, if your shared cred for all, all this shared stuff um, you're bringing in. And you have, and that's it. You know, so you only have one K UID um, that, 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 that your UID can map to. Uh, but, but, um, you know, but we want one shared one. But what if you have uh, two directories, one of, like, again, in this case, imagine if you wanted to mount this in here. Yeah. So, uh, then how would so you... So if you mount this one in here, if it's read-write, you just use this cred. If, you know, you, that, that's the normal case, using this cred. But it's either this cred or this cred. It's either your but shared but we, one but or your... What if we want to shift that one as well? Yeah. Um, it's just... Yeah. This point is, this is K20, this is not yeah. really root, this is K50. We need a K50 cred somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah. So presumably, is it, is it, sorry. Presumably yeah, you have a good point. That's like, right. Yeah, you know, if you mount K... Uh, if you go to, go to K20, then it's like K500. K5000, which is... Yeah, anyway, that it, normal read-write case is that. Um, you know, having multiple... Ha having more than Sorry, more than one or point two. This point is this diagram is wrong. This should be K twenty, right? Oh, well, no, no, no. Well, oh, this is just some arbitrary other file. Um, I guess my point is, if you want to have multiple shifts, sorry, is this with this system you wouldn't? Sorry, with this system you wouldn't be able to have multiple shifts of things in yeah, one yeah, user namespace, yeah. basically. Right. The point okay. is, multiple shifts are really just not used. Usually, the shift is just a reverse shift of what this mapping is. Right. It's either you flip you you flip it to reverse or you do nothing with it. Yeah. Uh, those two cases would be covered by one cred plus its cash. Well, mm. uh, well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, yeah. so for currently for the current cases we do that is true because if we ne needed to share data between two containers, we would store it and shift it on the host and shift it to both of them, even if they've got different maps. But there is, in theory, nothing preventing us from actually wanting to share a file from one container straight into the other. Um, both being unprivileged, both of different maps. <coughs> and this, you know, and that's where things get, you know, you know there, there's, there's theory and there is accelerating the common case. <coughs> and this is excel about accelerating the common case um, and making it fast and cheap. So you, now, the one part that this, th th this thought design does not cover right now is where do we put, it, put, uh, put in here overlay FS? Um, yeah. and, and does this interact? I haven't so thought through if this interacts properly with overlay <coughs> FS, which would have to sit on top of the bind mount, um, w w which has the uh, um, has, has the you use the shared map to it. It wouldn't at all. This is part of the VFS, so overlay FS would take the place of the bind mount, right? It's it's a mount point yeah, in the system. Huh? Um, yeah, yeah but overlay FS on top of something that has a mount underneath it, like a lower deer that has mounts, only the yeah. directory is, right. to, is lower deer. The point is you can mount overlay FS and set your flag, and then all of the shifting is done as part of overlay FS, right? Because overlay FS provides the VFS mount structure. Well, um, so last I looked at overlay FS, it needs to know what the underlying file system is. Uh, no, it overlay FS just ex like for example, it looks. Does the underlying file system have a, a dop revalidate? And if that's the case, then refuse what's going on. But it doesn't really poke into what the underlying file system is. Well, but it, but but, but it needs to know where it is. It needs to be configured. Well, uh, so yeah, o overlay FS has this concept of upper and lower dentries, right? That's okay. all it needs to know. Yeah. And where we shift the VFS does not. The, the VFS creds doesn't matter to overlay FS yeah. at all. So okay. we can do it in the, the uh, where you, when you mount overlay FS, it creates its own VFS mount, which has a struct mount. We can set the flag in that. Yeah. Everything should just work. I mean, that's my theory anyway. Y yeah, I, yeah. I, under is I, I mean, I, there will be a problem if you try to do overlay on top of shift, but yeah. that's, yeah, but, but I think that you shouldn't do that. Um, well, we need to have some sensible limitations, I yeah. think. So, but I mean, yeah. somebody said earlier about supporting Docker inside of a container. Isn't that what Docker is mm. going to want to do? It's going to want to mount overlay FS within your container that has a shifted yeah, bind mount? Read-only layer, yeah. Um, right, but, um, but, but doc, Docker in a container, in an unprivileged container, is a nested user namespace uh, thing anyway. Uh, this flag 
does it just say go back to the first user namespace you can find? In which case that no, would be well, well, it could be. Well, it could be. Yeah. Well, it, w w what it would mean is you look at your cred. Your cred has a user namespace. Yeah, your cred has a user namespace. You find the mappings from your user namespace and you do the translation if you're on the slow path. Right, but um, the point I'm making is if the user namespace is nested and the flag is set, it just goes back to the first oh. user namespace it yeah. can find. And so we can do it like that. I mean, the whole object of doing this is to actually get Docker to bloody well use the user namespace because it doesn't today. Um, uh, well, among other things, right? Yeah. Or also it yeah. can fix other problems. Yeah. Yeah. Docker or, or the sy systems it ha has inspired. Um, I think Todd. Yeah, Todd, Todd that yeah. But, you know, I <coughs> think, yeah, I, I have, you know, this is where I get it. Can, yeah. So, how, how does Docker decide which creds it uses when it's writing to the lower file system? Well, it's also Docker. Right? Right, right, sorry, sorry. Overlay FS, sorry. Um, it has blazed in my head. Isn't overlay FS doing the same thing we did for ShiftFS, where it uses the creds of the mounter of the super block? Yeah. I had it using override creds at one point. So it used, I think, the mounter's creds to talk to, or to look at its yeah. my thing. I, d I think it still does that. But I, I didn't pass the patch on stream again to right. Vivek. So oh, it only does the underlying FS copy up, right? Sorry. Uh, well, you've got, you've got more than one underlying FS. Well, you've got so a, a number of static sorry. ones and a workspace. Yeah, 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 yeah. Static, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so but, but it only does copy up from everything ex except for the for the yeah. right of But I right? think it uses the mounters creds for everything. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, overlay us. We use the same. We use the same approach. When the mounter of the superblock, uh, the creds of the uh, mounter of the superblock becomes the one that uh, that get called every time over if overlayfs is making a decision to access the file system. But it will still work because overlayfs will have two creds. It will have the user's real creds and it will have the mounter's <coughs> creds, both of which can have a cached map, both of which done by the shared map. Yeah. Everything should function normally. I yeah, so I, I would yeah. assume so. My intuition says on the writable layer we want you know, the, the ordinary cred and for copying these up we want the sh shared cred. Yeah, and we want mappings on both done through the shared map yeah. and in that case everything should just work because we can do the caching which is still one layer. Oh, sorry. I think, I think the way to think of overlayfs is you go to, you go to overlay, overlayfs to do the, the translation and then you start again so it's a completely new ma new translation. So it, it's just you go to a less, then you start again when it goes to the the lower lower reaches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if those those mounts have the bit set on them to fo force you to the shared, and you come in here with your ordinary cred, I th think that works. Um, so the eight goes mounted, and the mount goes to Yeah. Yeah. What? I think we can make it work with a single flag. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's the, 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 that's the current brainstorm. Yeah. I want to remind everyone that this session is recorded, so you can watch it later if you're confused yes, about sorry. what actually <laughs> has happened. <laughs> uh, so fuck it. I just had one question about setting a flag in the mount. Um, as I recall, there's a lot of places in the VFS that can't actually get back to the mount through which something was accessed. Is that going to be an issue for this identifying is whether these? This is entry for the uh, APIs, right? So, yeah, okay. Uh, the file systems don't, apart from things that take file stars, most, most of the file system operations don't get a path. But we're talking about doing the override above the file system layer in the VFS where there is a path. So, you know, just, just a little, just, just, just a it, it small waits. matter of adi adding a path. His point is that not every VFS API takes a path. Some of them take a dentry instead of a path, and we have a problem because they're, they're blind to the mount, the struct mount. Ready? But, but uh, what, was, what we were talking about is actually doing the over override in the VFS before it calls the file system. So the file system sees the translated stuff. So when the file system goes to look at current cred, it sees that guy. And the VFS just ha ha has already swapped that out if it's appropriate by looking at the path. 
as long as the we always have a way of getting through the path, that should work. But I seem to remember there was there was some. So Ted Ted Cho also wants this single flag <laughs> approach for a particular use case, which is mount with case insensitive, mm. where he's trying to use ext4 for DOS type file systems. And his problem in doing that, which he got a scheme very like this, was there were certain VFS APIs where it was blind to the actual, it didn't have the path, so it didn't have struct mount, it only had the dentry, because the path is the mount plus the dentry. And you can't reconstruct the flag state unless you have the mount, so you can't reconstruct it with only the dentry. And so there are a few VFS APIs where he thought it needed to be rethreaded to get this to work, okay. and I think you have the same problem. Um, quite. You know, possibly, but we, we need to find, find that. That, 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 that. That's one of the holes we were looking for. On the flip side, I think um, if the common case is going to be below overlay FS, it, it might make sense to, to teach overlay FS, you, you make certain overlay FS is doing the right thing on copy up. And, and I think that's one path we have to get. And then we're. Well, let's uh, um, just take a note to see if, if we still have this VFS dentry yeah. problem. It, 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 yeah. I also wonder if we still need if we still need some changes in other file systems. Like as far as I remember, the AOCFL case we I brought up for a ButterFS. Just maybe you can help me walk through this. Uh, it checks: Do I have permissions over the inode, right? And am I or am I capable in the initial or am I capable and is capable in the user namespace? Either it needs both or one of the two, but like, for example, how do you deal with the case where it checks, am I privileged with respect to the underlying inode? Well, but if we swap the cred before the permission check, and I know permission doesn't take a path, so we have to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and so you just do that swap in, in IOCTAL <coughs> um, if, if the path you're dealing with needs, um, has the bit set. We have the path because we have a file star, and the file star has a path in it. So even the, Ioc the IOCTAL call has a path available. But it's capable of both inputs. Right. <laughs> uh, I guess other IOCTALs that actually pass like a raw UID, it's not, not just a capability check, but like an actual. Well, they should be using the translation thing already. Well, no, no, but th this would be the, tr yes, for the devices translate. Yes, for the <laughs> Am I better at you first? Um, uh, yes, for the device translation, but not for the other one, right? It, you, wouldn't well, be able to, you wouldn't be able to translate on, on the... Well, if you're passing it to raw UID, it depends what it's going to do with that raw UID. If it's actually going to just write it straight to disk. Yes, this is the problem. This would require a, uh, either the, I, the uh, IOCTAL handler vetting, so or it would require some sort of override. Right. Right. Um. The but the if you translate the cred before you get there, you're fine. Yeah, I'm just I'm just careful. I would just be careful to be uh, so cheery about the Aoctal case because Aoctals have proven to be really really horrible because they bypass all kinds of permissions and file yeah. systems do not crazy stuff. Yeah. But well, they do crazy well. stuff to be honest. In uh, uh, behind the VFS yeah, yeah. has no control over whatsoever. That's why I'm just yeah kind of. Careful. Yeah, we, we can put a trans set a translation around it, but if it's doing something crazy like just taking this and writing straight to disk, short of changing the driver, there's nothing we can do about it. Even using ShiftFS, there's nothing you can do. Right. About uh, it. Yeah. I think. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think there will also be file system changes needed, but that's a different topic. Yeah. That's independent yeah. of uh, ShiftFS stuff. Yeah, I was going to say like I mean for on like for ShiftFS, we don't just like. For in, in the BurfS case, we don't just like forward everything. Obviously, we do validation for exactly what IOCTALs we know are supposed to be safe and provision yeah. what case. And for this, we could totally have particular VFS be, oh, that bit is set. Um, go check whether the file system has advertised itself as being able to do those things yeah. safely. If not, then you just reject the IOCTAL entirely. Um, uh, to try and make it safe so that yeah. you can land that stuff without you know, causing security issues. The, the, the IOCTAL, so the driver can see that the, the trans a translation is in place. So mm -hmm. we could put the, make the driver do the auditing. Yeah, mm. yeah I mean the, obviously we w we're going to need to code in the actual file systems. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, yeah. 
just looking, so we're going to have trouble with extended attributes. They still only take the entries, not files. So they're going to have to be rethreaded, right? All of the X attributes. Oh, well, that needs to get fixed anyway. It's buggy. Oh, so everybody agrees it needs to be fixed. It's just that nobody has tried to fix it yet because they're all waiting for somebody else to fix it. So you just stepped in the tar pit. Uh, <laughs> No, 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 no I, I actually know, yeah, I think I know, you know, it's just one of those. That this this is what Cockinell is for. Get link is, for. is going to be another problem. So well, these are your problem APIs. It's yeah. the extended attribute <laughs> and get link. Um, uh, link API is another crappy one, look at that. So these, uh, all these VFS, a VFS APIs are going to have to be all. Oh, no. Those are the, 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 that's what the file system implements. You know, we're, you know, we're looking at, the um, VFS, yeah, VFS read, VF, or, 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 or above that, in the system calls. So we don't necessarily have to change these. Um, because we're, we're changing current cred before we call those. That's, that's the idea. And there's something that ShiftFS couldn't do in the first. Yeah. You know, I, I, we could prototype it with just ShiftFS changing current cred, but, um, but, 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 but that, that's the idea, and if we can change current cred in the right location, it'll be real cheap and fast. That's so so the, the, the upshot is we still have to prototype it? Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Oh, that's okay, we always annoy you. <laughs> okay. Oh, we've still one there. Oh, it's a 40 hour ago, I was walking right by the. Ah, there you go. Oops. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. All right, awesome. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so this is uh, about securing path resolution uh, with OpenAT2 and libpathRS. So hi, I'm Alexa, uh, and I'll be talking about some work that I've been doing for the past couple of months, and hopefully open some discussion about, um, to get an idea of what I've missed. Um, so I'm gonna give a quick whirlwind tour for those of you who don't know what this work is, along with some of the problems that it solves, uh, solves uh, and then we can get into discussion. Um, so, what I'm, uh, so first of all, where can you find all this stuff? I should probably start with this. So um, the patch set, the Linux patch set is here on GitHub um, at that branch. I posted v12 last week and uh, it has some fixes already so I'll post v13 maybe next week. Uh, there's another an article uh, about it which gives a pretty good overview over OpenAT2 and what each flag does and what the features are. Uh, and then libpathRS lives, lives there. So first let's talk about what is an example of an unsafe resolution of a path. Um, and this, this sort of, once you look into it, it starts, it starts getting pretty scary pretty quickly. So effectively, uh, if you have a, a privileged program that is opening slash foo slash, slash, foo slash bar slash shadow, and bar is it controlled by an attacker, um, there are a variety of uh, scenarios where uh, the attacker can start tricking the program into opening files it shouldn't mean to. So for instance, if shadow is a symlink, you could, you you can make it open, I don't know, Etsy Shadow or some other uh, bad file. However, you can fix that with Ono oh Follow, which uh, blocks uh, trailing symlinks from being followed. However, what if bar is a symlink? Um, so in other words, what if bar is a symlink to slash Etsy? Um, how do you detect this? And there isn't actually a native way of detecting this uh, within open. Um, and so effectively the solution here, so what happened is you'll open Etsy Shadow on the host and then possibly pipe it to output and bad things happen. So it's like, okay, well the solution is to sanitize the path. 
in user space. And this is actually, as, as an aside, you see the CVE list down here. <laughs> These are the list of programs that have tried this. Um, effectively, Docker did this for, for a long time. Um, Docker still does this. Uh, there are a bunch of other programs that do, do this where they try to sanitize the path in user space, um, where effectively you walk down the path components and you say, okay, is foo a symlink, yes or no? Foo isn't a symlink, okay, keep foo. Is bar a symlink? Oh, bar is a symlink, so I'll, then I'll take, I'll read what bar is and then I'll resolve it and then if I wanna stay inside foo, I'll do all the path resolution and so on and so on. And then you put a new string which is, ah, oh, this is the safe path. But what if one of the components gets changed after you've done the sanitization? It's a classic time of check, time of use attack and there's not really much you can do with this case. Now, as, you, as I'll mention later, there is a way you can do this safely today, uh, but it's very, very complicated to do correctly. It requires a lot of fiddling with OPath file descriptors and double checking through procfs. Effectively, I would argue that, that there are very few programs that do this correctly today, um, and yet it's such, an, it's such a common operation. I mean, open a file is the first thing you learn in Unix programming, so it's a little bit scary that, that the sort of basics are quite, are quite worrying. Um, and so yeah, so there are, these are all examples of CVEs that are at least related either directly or tangentially, um, and there are probably many, many more countless undiscovered bugs that are, that are related to this. Um, and so the solution for this is to add a set of flags to open that allows you to restrict the resolution process, which is what openat 2 is, which I'll go through in a second. But this is one problem uh, that needs to get solved. While I was working through this, I discovered a couple more problems. Uh, one of them is uh, file descriptive trickery. So this is something that is, that is actually not very well known, at least from what I've seen. Um, is that you can, you can reopen a file descriptor. So let's say you open a file descriptor, I don't know, foo, and you open it with read, with read capabilities. You can then reopen it through proc self fd with write capabilities, even though you originally opened it with read capabilities. Now, um, it should be noted, obviously, that there are still inode permission checks going on, so it's not like you can open anything. Um, but the primary problem is, is that there are examples where you get a file descriptor and you shouldn't it doesn't make sense for you to be able to open it for writing. For instance, this security bug over here, CV, blah, blah, blah. The way this was exploited is that um, you open proc self exe, right, which is, a, which is a pointer to the executable of an existing process, and you open it for reading. You obviously can't open it for writing because it's the live memory of an executable. You, you get eText busy. So you open it for reading, then you wait for the process to die, and then you reopen it for writing. And this is in the context of a container. So the container has no way of accessing this host, this host file, and yet it can open it for writing. Um, it should be noted, however, and also this works with OPath, so you don't have to open it for reading, you can open it with OPath, and so on and so on. Um, the point being that, uh, this, the point is this is actually useful. So both LXC and RunC actually use this to improve the security of containers through a variety of, of, of um, quite hairy tricks, but effectively this is actually quite a useful feature. The problem is the, this fact that you can open something for reading and then later open it for writing. Um, so the solution for this problem is, um, which is what the patch it does, which is that uh, it makes magic links. These Proxelf FD sim links are actually more magical, um, and so we, we obey the, their modes. Um, the F mode is exposed in, Proc is exposed in ProcFS if you look at, uh, oops. Uh, so uh, this, the, uh, I'm running the version with my patch so the mode looks different to what it looks like on your system, but the point is, is, that, um, uh, is that this is F mode. So this file is opened with uh, read and write, so you get read and write here. So what you do is that when I try to open this file descriptor, this is a, a permission check is actually done on this. In old kernels, this wasn't done, um, and so on and so on. So um, that's the solution, and then, uh, whoops. Uh, let's go forward. Running? Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and then you just have to fix that. And then also, um, uh, for other reasons, you need to also deal with OPath. And OPath inherits the mode of a magic link, effectively, which solves both problems. Um, and then one more thing is that um, one thing that's coming up quite often is that there are examples of use cases where you need uh, to do things without procfs. Um, and now that, we have the, now that we have this hardening to stop these types of attacks, we can now expose uh, the ability to open a file descriptor without procfs. So this open at is identical to open proxlfd, but without any procfs. Um, and then obviously because of backwards compatibility problems, um, uh, OMG path actually doesn't cause uh, the whole thing where basically open has never actually checked for invalid flags before. So, um, but because, because this OMT path only acts for empty strings, um, there's no backwards compatibility, 
compatibility problem because MP string paths have always been invalid. Okay, and then there's OpenR2, which is um, the actual syscall. So effectively, this allows us to, um, and as, as has been mentioned a couple of times today, um, we're now moving towards extensible syscalls now. So uh, effectively, rather than adding new flag arguments, instead we pass a struct. The struct has flags in mode just as old open. However, it should be noted that uh, unlike open, uh, we give you e val if the flag is unknown or if the mode is set when it shouldn't be set. So effectively, you actually get a return value telling you, no, actually, this kernel doesn't support this feature. Um, this upgrade mask is related to, um, to reopening. I can get into it if anyone's interested, but effectively, it allows you to, um, as I said, opath inherits the mode, but this lets you restrict it. So you can say, you can open an opath of a file, but you can say you cannot open this for re reading, even if you normally could. And then resolve flags is the, is the resolution problem that I was mentioning with, um, with Fubar Baz. Effectively, you could, this is where the new flags go, um, and you can extend this struct by increasing the size and adding new feature fields. So people have already mentioned to me some ideas for new, um, for new extensions we could do to open, and because this is extensible, you can, you can do this. Um, this, this work was discussed last year, so I'm not going to go through any of this. Uh, effectively, these are the new flags. They let you block through resolution certain things, so you can block mount point crossings, you can block uh, magic links, sim links, uh, you can block uh, jumps to root and dot dot escaping root, and resolve in root effectively is like a ch root uh, during resolution, uh, but, for, but we, we deal with some of the ch root problems, so it, it doesn't actually, it's, it doesn't escape, uh, you can't escape it. Um, and, so, and then the last thing um, is libpathRS. So all of this work is very useful, but the thing is, is that uh, using open, the resolving root stuff is actually quite complicated um, because um, not all syscalls support it. Obviously, only one syscall supports it, but in order to write a program that deals with the file system, you need to do more than just open things. You need to, for instance, uh, hard link things, unlink things, so on and so on. So effectively, you need to um, use a different... Um, yeah, you need to have different semantics, and effectively, um, to use it correctly, you would in fact need to uh, take a path, resolve it as a file descriptor, and then pass around the file descriptor. A lot of programs instead deal with with strings as paths, which is which is not actually the right model if you're trying to be defend against um, attackers. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think um, yes. We probably we would need to change user space over time, but open and uh, two is extremely useful. Uh, for programs that want to be secure proactively. Like, I mean, container managers are, in this case, um, something that, it's just the obvious example. It's yeah. like, I'm managing mounting for, uh, or whatever path resolution for a process I don't fully trust, uh, uh, or configured by a user that I don't fully trust. That That's really, that's really it's useful right away, I mean. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, for instance, if you want to extract within, with inside a, a root that you don't trust, this also protects you against that, um, and so on and so on. Uh, but the, another key thing, and this is sort of the real reason why I wrote this, is um, how on earth do you deal with old kernels? Because obviously, OpenAt2 today is great, but you still need programs to run on old kernels. What this library does is that it actually emulates resolving root on old kernels. Now, I mentioned that this is difficult to do, um, it's actually, but it's not impossible. Um, effectively, you can safely... Re so, you can safely resolve paths um, using uh, opath descriptors whereby you emulate the opening. So you have foo bar as. You open foo as opath, you, then you check it, and then you underneath it open another, the next component. Okay. If you have the right combination of ono oh follow and so on and so on, it ends up being, um, being safe. And actually, I have, I have examples um, where you can actually do the, the rename attack for the CVs I mentioned. It doesn't work if you, if you, uh, if you use the emulated version. So the same attack fails on both the kernel version and the emulated version. Um, yep. The difference for resolve in, ro resolve in root being that you don't get an error, it's just always uh, when you try to escape uh, from your current root is you just get resolved to the current root, right? You, no, 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 you get exdev now. Ah, uh, this was oh, changed, okay. yes. So this, uh, then it's basically exactly what, what we did, uh, what we do in Lexi when we mount Right, yeah, this okay. is, yeah, okay. this is yeah, basically sorry. the same thing yes. that LXC and LXC and LXD do, it's just that right. it's a separate library so that people can use it, because it also, sure. it also has an idiomatic, effectively it's, it's made such that it's more idiomatic to use, because rather than it being like you write the program logic to use opath everywhere, oh, instead, yeah. yeah, exactly, I've seen the code too, effectively you, you, you have a handle which is actually an FD, and then, and then you, uh, 
that wasn't meant to be a dig. It's, it's always going to be ugly unless you, unless you separate it out. Um, and so the idea would be to use this. Uh, the only downside, and I'm sure people will have opinions about this, is that it's currently a Rust library. I know that this is going to cause many problems. Um, yeah, I mean, if people really want it to be written, it can be done. Um, but from what I've heard, Rust libraries and distributions is no longer as much of a nightmare as it was two years ago. Um, but feel free to prove me wrong on Keep that Keep telling that to yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, does so, does sorry, it have I, C bindings? Sorry? Does your Rust library have C bindings? Yeah, yeah, the, the main interface is C bindings. And in fact, I have, uh, I have a Python wrapper. Um, I don't know if I have it on this laptop, but I have a Python, whatever. The point is I have a Python wrapper, which, um, right. which I use for testing, which uses the C FFI libraries, uses Python's FFI, and then the FFI into, into Rust. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, in my, yeah. Rust has, uh, so having written programs in Rust as well and working on like a sort of exemplary kernel, kernel module, the, the really nice thing is that you, it has bindgen, which generates C bindings automatically. Then you still have to do some wrapper writing work, but it's like well thought out and it's, it's, it's done. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to do it yourself. Yeah, and so the, the idea is effectively, um, the, what the, actually, I can actually just show you what it looks like. So if I go to, uh, So the, the API looks something like, um, so this is like, uh, oops. So you open a root with a path, and then uh, you then underneath it can do uh, mkdir underneath the path, you can do mknode, and all of this is backed by resolving root. The idea is that this, this basically looks like normal syscalls, but instead it's, um, it's using the, the resolve in root, uh, handling all of the weird cases where, for instance, you need to unlink a file, you need to resolve in root the director, the parent, and then you need to unlink the child, and for rename, rename exchange, you need to, open, so on and so on. So dealing with all of that, all of that um, lovely semantics. As an aside, uh, I discovered that there's no way in Linux to, to just unlink something uh, without caring what it is, because if you try to unlink something that's a directory, unlink at has at removed it, uh, yeah. you, cannot, you cannot just say unlink it, I don't care what it is, um, as a complete, I mean, it, I don't care. I can just retry. It's just it's just funny that this doesn't exist. Um, and yeah, and then once you have a once you have one of these handles, so you res so th then you resolve a handle within the root. You get this handle descriptor, which is an O path of the thing you're you just resolved, and then you can reopen it uh, to get an actual FD. Is the is the idea use case? The reason why you have this intermediate resolve is for the LXC use case, or rather the container use case, whereby. Uh, you want to be able to reopen dev PTS PTMX inside a container, if I, because it's, you can't. Yeah, it's that's not even it's not even that uh, that pressing of an issue because we haven't really uh, we haven't really uh, uh, made much use of this uh, uh, for the. So basically, we're still in using the dev PTS mount from uh, from the host, not inside of the inside of the container. So it's not really uh, that important. So it shouldn't block okay. your. Uh, Okay. I mean, it just works. Patch set. It's, already, it's already done. So it, it, it's His already point works. being, if you're doing an open on the dev PTMX device, you automatically get a, uh, a slave FD uh, for the slave side. Uh, so you automatically allocate a new PTS device. Uh, whereas if you do an OPAD, you don't trigger an actual open. Um, so you can send that FD around and then reopen get it to a proc self time. FD and then upgrade it. And at that time, you get a, uh, you get a PTS yeah. device. Which this is uh, the, main, the main use case. This is the trick he's been, he's been talking right. about. The, uh, the other point is, is that uh, with, path, uh, with path around handle is that uh, ideally what you would have is that programs would currently path around, pass around string paths. They would resolve the path and then pass this around instead. And then when they would normally do the open on the string, they would use this. Dep obviously, it depends very much on what the program is doing, but that would be the, the, ideal, the ideal case. Um, and then I, I have a Python wrapper around this that does the same, the same stuff. Uh, and because I need this for my, uh, for Umochi, which is the OCI image tool I have, I'm also writing a Go wrapper for it. So it definitely, you can use it for different languages. Um, even if I end up rewriting it in C, it would, the wrappers would still work. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and the important point is the reason why I have a library and not just using a syscall is that uh, to correctly use the syscall, you would need to rewrite or rather port programs to use it anyway. So the idea was, was that if we have a more idiomatic wrapper, it might be more easy to convince people to use it because from I've had some emails from people telling me that, oh, I saw you found the CV in Docker. Actually, it turns out these other 10 programs have the exact same problem. Um, and so ideally, we can, we can fix those programs um, much more quickly than having to teach everyone what is the correct way to do an open, um, which is more complicated than it maybe should be. Um, and then yeah, what's next? Effectively, open at 2 merged. There are some open questions. I've put some flame bait there in case we want to go into that. And um, 
The other thing is to port programs to the path rest. And the neat thing is, is that we don't actually need the kernel work to start doing the porting effort because again, the emulation will, will work on all the kernels. Um, but yeah, so any, any comments? Oh, sorry, the open question, as an example of the open questions is that um, uh, Andy Lutiniski had an idea for, for flags which is to try to try to fix up flags now, now that, but I think that that's pretty much been been knacked by everyone in the room, uh, right? Linus and Ingo, I think. Yeah, I think that's I think that's I think that's dead in the water. Basically, and the problem no, is is yeah. that um uh, is that o, it's been a long-standing thing where o read only is equal to zero, and it would be nice to not have this problem because um it, ha it causes issues elsewhere. But um I think that's pretty much not not going to change effectively. I think. Um, uh, the, yes. The problem being, as far as I understand. The concern being that if you change, if you require too much change from user space, like getting used to new flags and whatever, then the switch is never going to happen or in, 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 in 20 years. Yeah, yeah. So effectively, if we just keep the same flags and we don't have to worry about people not wanting to switch because it's you just. You need a set of new architectures that don't implement open, but only implement open at two. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and sorry, and one other thing is... Case uh, in point, I, I, IPv6, the same as IPv4, just longer. <laughs> uh, I'm not commenting on that. Um, so, uh, and then the other thing is, is sort of future work, which I, I mentioned, I talked to Eric about, which is um, uh, right now, there is no way to limit what file descriptors can be executed. So uh, essentially, if you have an, a file descriptor which the underlying file happens to be executable, if you open it for reading, for instance, you cannot limit it from, from being executed through F, uh, FX exec VE, sorry, this is not the syscall, this is the wrapper, exec VE, yes, like you, you can exit it, exec it through prox of FD or through um, add empty path. The point being that, uh, for instance, I mean, I'm trying to think of, of a good example of where this would be useful, um, but for instance, imagine you're passing an FD to a process you don't trust and it's a set UID file. Let's say you're like, I don't know, dumping all strings in a binary or something silly, right? And you want, you give it a set UID program as, read, as readable. You don't want them to later be able to execute it. Maybe it's a buggy set UID binary. Um, you can't do this limitation. I mean, you can unset it, you can set minus exit. Um, but yeah, I, I think that uh, it would be neat to be able to do this limiting. But the problem is, is that right now, as far as I can tell, uh, there isn't an equivalent way to read and write because read and write have F mode write and mm -hmm. so on and so on. Um, but yeah, that's. Yeah. I think um, at, at some point Proc had, had, had problems um, <laughs> in this area where you could like um, exec, um, you know, um, proc, proc PID environ or something right. like that. Yeah, <laughs> and um, there was also something where, where it wasn't checking the permissions when you um, owned it, oh god, or you modded it, yeah. um, something like that. You can probably look in the Git history and find it. Right. But I have this vague, uh, vague memory that it's actually been a problem in the past, and that might might be w w worth looking up. Right, because in the case of proc, uh, blah blah, blah uh, oh actually no, Environ, Environ isn't a magic link though, is it? No, that's the thing. It, okay. It's not a magic link. Does it have it's a magic file. Oh god! Uh, that comes out. Uh, that, that, that reads the process's memory, so you can make it say whatever you want it to say. Oh right. Right. You you can overwrite it. Shit. <laughs> yeah, that's, you, that, you, that'll you, that'll be a different. Yeah, issue, it's yeah. All, you get into all these problems where uh, you can overwrite the environment in in Procself something something, and in glibc the environment a global variable for your process will not get updated and all that. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, so actually, so environment isn't isn't mapped. I, I always assumed it was a like a mapped, or is it like read and then stored somewhere? I think it's read and stored somewhere. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So, sorry. No. Uh, it's one comment about the FXV. That's probably something you envision for the future, in the sense after the initial version of OpenN2 has been merged. Yeah, uh, we discussed this um, uh, yes, last, we, uh, yesterday, I, and effectively it boils down to yeah. It's first of all, it would it would block it for too long because I'm yes, I'm not great. convinced. Okay. Yes, it would. Block I just it. wanted to I just wanted to say I know you you like to get you have a lot of good ideas for good features, but don't stuff. Them yeah, yeah, we need we much. should get it first. Yeah, exactly. That's, um, um, yeah, yeah, and um, and question uh, because I I think there, there's a good a answer to this. But what is the advantage of the native sys calls over the emulation? Uh, so there are a couple. So uh, so resolve in root. Okay, there are there are a couple. So um, the first thing is is that is that these ones are not well. 
actually the one that's most obviously not possible uh, today is resolve no magic links uh, because uh, the kernel does not expose whether or not something is a magic link. And so what in the resolution, in, in libpathRS what I do is that I actually block all symlink resolution on proc uh, because I can't tell whether it's gonna be a magic link or not uh, until I go through it and, even, and I, don't wanna, I don't even wanna play with going through it. Um, I, think you, I think you can do this. You can L, like something like L start open and F start if you can open. Uh, no, 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 but the thing if, is, is that if you do LSTAT, uh, sorry, if you get... Um, so check open and recheck whether you open the same you checked. Um, I think this works. Uh, yes, you, you So you would open that, yeah. and find out it's a magic? Uh, right, the, 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 problem, the problem is, is that uh, um, it, depend, uh, sorry, it depends on when, during when, when in resolution you are, but um, there are some files that are unsafe to even open. Uh, for instance, consoles, if you're, if you're a detached process and you open a file, this can be fixed with OC, no CTY, this is another thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are, some, there are some file descriptors which I, ideally you wouldn't even want to try to open. But you're right, if, if you want to do this, effectively, like, the point is that on proc, you have proc self, which uh, is, a sim, is an actual sim link. It's not, it's not a magic link, but uh, everything in proc self pid is a magic link, for instance. My point is that, is that effectively you, you end up blocking actual sim links rather than things. Um, but yeah, effectively the, the main argument is that um, it's more efficient and it's more, uh, it's more efficient than doing the opening. Because imagine, again, if you want to use libpathRS, you would do this for every single uh, operation on the file system. If you're constantly doing, doing this resolving and reopening and so on and so on, um, it does drag. Like it goes from being one syscall to, to 50, um, effectively. And then, because um, you have to do the opath, then you have to do a check, then you also have to read proc self F, read link proc self FD to see whether or not it is the path you expected and so on and so on. So it's, it, it requires, like the, the blow up is massive. Do you, can you make it, uh, so uh, two questions, I think, the performance argument is yeah. enough already in the sense, and it's way too complicated what you have to do to actually get this right in, in, uh, in, in user space. Um, so yeah, and now I forget what I wanted to say. I've been at this conference too long. <laughs> Go on. Okay, right, um, and, uh, and yeah, like you could emulate these, though I oh. think that they're more, they're, it's, sorry, what, what, of course, yes. Um, uh, now you can wait. Um, <laughs> It's much, much more um, straightforward and obviously correct to do them in the kernel, effectively. Um, like, for instance, uh, noxdev is, is very obvious to do in the kernel. You just do on pick mount or whatever the, uh, whatever the function is. You just check, as opposed to um, in user space, you would need to do uh, fstat app, and then you would need to do, then you would need to care about, um, then you would need to care about overlay fs, where it's um, the, the uh, for underlay file, it's, it's, a, it's a different file system, even though it's the same mount, and so on and so on. So effectively, this, this becomes complicated. Is, yes. it, uh, is the, uh, the emulation user space talk to free? Sorry? It, it, does it have like a time of check, time of use problems? Is it race free, the emulation you do? Without uh, as as far as I know, it is. Uh, so is it basically, we do similar to what you do, which Shh, is that just once said you no. Okay. <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Effectively, what it does is that it, it does the it does the open chain, and then at the very very end, it does a recheck with proxel fd to see okay. whether or not it is the path we expected, um, yes. which which okay. should be which should be good enough effectively. Yeah. Um, we basically meaning that at some point this path actually did resolve to this this thing without intermediate uh, symlink screw, uh, screwy effectively. Okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, control box. But uh, the rechecking cannot recheck the magic links, right? The read link. Sorry? Or, uh, if you do the check in the end, will it solve the, like it will solve the sim link, but will it solve the other issues? Uh, so if you do the, uh, so in, in, the, in the user space emulation, so in, in libpathRS, what we do is that um, uh, we take, so effectively what you do is that you, you, you do the walk of each component, and then once you're done, you then look at the file, final file descriptor you have at the very end, and then you say, uh, this file descriptor, uh, what does it point to? And then you do that check by doing read link proc self fd the number, and then you compare that to internally what you thought the path should be, um, effectively, is, is what you do. Um, yeah, which means, that, which means that if there is a race, you, you catch it. This is the important point, is that you, you can catch when, when a race happens. Um, and, and obviously, and sorry, another thing is that there are cases where proc self uh, fd blah will give you slash because it, it detects an escape effectively. 
and this is resolved if you use resolve in, in root, because the restriction isn't the same. Um, but yeah. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah. What, one additional thing we can do that I mentioned to you already is that we could add two new mount flags potentially. Yes. One to say if there are any uh, auto mounts in this mount, just don't ever trigger them, just return e remote IO. Yep. And the other one is if you see a sim link in here and you follow it and it wants to cross into another mount point, say in the ex dev, yep. I think those should be relatively straightforward to do. Yeah, and yeah. that's all. That's also that we something definite that what we uh, what you want. We discussed this yesterday, and I think this is a really great idea. But I think both are useful. Like the open end to path resolution stuff is useful, and that is certainly yeah. very useful for and containers. And actually, you just reminded me of something, which is that it might even be helpful to have resolve no uh, auto mount. Um, that might be something useful because uh, obviously there is a there is a look. I don't know what it's called. Lookup no no auto mount or whatever, where it won't trigger an auto mount on lookup. Eighteen no auto mount. <coughs> Sorry. I think I think eighteen no auto auto mount. Uh, yes, I don't remember what the what the internal flag is called in um in uh yes there is also that um but also but there's also an internal flag which is the lookup flag that it oh, it maps to well, it. And I, I was saying lo lookup auto mount. I think it's inverted. Yeah, yeah, Possibly. sure. And the idea is that you could we could have a resolve no auto mount as well, which which does a similar thing. But yeah, that would be useful because it would allow you to have um programs which don't use OpenAT two uh to also be safe against jumping out of the um out of yeah. out of the out of the mount point. Um, it would be it would be neat, and I'm sure that there are there are other use cases aside from apart from that. But I think uh, that alone is is a good enough use case. Right. Yeah. It would basically become f for every intelligent container runtime, it would become the default mount option. Yeah. Uh, actually, one thing I want to mention is, is an aside. Someone mentioned that um, that yeah, well, one one downside of having a resolve no xdev flag is that okay. people yeah. bind mount all sorts of stuff. And so the one thing is that probably should be mentioned to people who are using this is so like, okay. please don't set this without giving the user an ability to disable it because otherwise you might end up with not being able to open like someone's home directory because they bind mounted something or whatever. Because um, this this is something, it will, but this is a this is a user um, concern. But yeah, are we out of time? Yeah, we are. Okay, all right. Um, so Thank we've you. got a fifteen minutes or ten minutes break. Ten minutes break, and we're back at six forty. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>